During author Jim Douglas's 2007 interview with theater concessionaire Butch Burroughs, Burroughs said that he saw two different people arrested in the Texas theater. He saw Harvey Oswald's arrest, and then, three or four minutes later, he watched his Dallas police arrested an Oswald lookalike. Butch Burroughs added that the second man arrested looked almost like Oswald, like he was his brother or something. Captain Westbrook was the highest-ranking officer at the Texas theater told his officer to cover Harvey Oswald's face and get him out of here. Apparently, Butch Burroughs saw both Harvey and Lee at the Texas Theater. Following the assassination, Captain Westbrook relocated to South Vietnam, where he worked as an advisor to the Saigon Police Department, courtesy of the CIA. Wow. Relocated to South Vietnam. And who's in charge of the Saigon military mission? Ed Lansdale. You have done monumental work, research work. You say there's a Harvey and a Lee. The records that you bring up are there. They can't be the same person. I didn't start off with Harvey and Lee. I started off looking at documents and soon realizing there was a lot of discrepancies in the height and the weight of this person the eye color, and then I started noticing that there were documents placing him in two different locations at the same time. My research is really very simple. All I do is collect documents. Um, I mean, I spent months at the National Archives. If you put all the documents in chronological order, then the story is right in front of you. It's like piecing together a puzzle. The tip of chain, one document after another document after another document after testimony and so on. You've got Harvey Oswald. He's been to Russia. He supports communism. That, of course, was a ruse to get him into Russia in the first place. But anyway, he's got this persona established as a supporter of communism, married to a Russian wife, pro-Castro, and all this. He's being set up for the assassination of President Kennedy. Now, he's not the one who goes to the sports storm rifle range or to the... That's Lee Oswald. Lee Oswald was used to set up Harvey as the patsy for shooting President Kennedy. Some 12 hours before the assassination, Mary Lawrence was working at the B&B restaurant, two doors from Jack Ruby's Vegas Club in downtown Dallas. She was the head waitress that had known Jack Ruby for the past eight years. She and the night cashier saw Jack Ruby and a man, young man identical to Lee Harvey Oswald in the restaurant shortly before midnight on November 22nd. Now, That's Lee Oswald, and he was with Jack Ruby many, many times, seen by many, many people in Dallas, Texas, in the summer of 1963. This is important, because in the summer of 1963, Harvey and Marina were in New Orleans. Minutes before midnight, November 22nd, when Jack Ruby was seen sitting at a table with a young man identical to Lee Oswald, Harvey Oswald was sleeping with his wife at Ruth Payne's house, 15 miles away in Irving, Texas. Following the assassination, Mary Lawrence reported Oswald being in her restaurant to the Dallas police and received a phone call on the December the 3rd from an unknown male. This unknown male told Mary, if you don't want to die, you better get out of town. And subsequently questioned by the Dallas police, Mary Lawrence stated that the man who threw him was, quote, positively Lee Harvey Oswald. Neither Mary Lawrence nor her friend were interviewed with the Warren Commission. Adding credibility to Mary Lawrence's report is the fact that very few people in America knew in 1963 what we know today, that Jack Ruby and Lee Oswald were seen together by many witnesses in different locations prior to the assassination in the summer of 1963. And many of these people gave statements with Oswald and Ruby together to both the Dallas police and to the FBI. Of course, that police are working on the assumption that there indeed is a connection between Jack Ruby and Lee Oswald, and that in some manner of speaking, Oswald's murder was to shut him up. Do you know Lee Oswald? Have you ever seen him? I saw him in the audience last week. Lee Oswald in the audience yeah. at the club, at the yeah. Carousel yeah. Club, which is owned by Jack Ruby? Yeah. The Warren Commission's version of Oswald's actions on November 22, 1963 is familiar to many researchers. What follows 
are the actual activities and whereabouts of Lee Oswald and Harvey Oswald on November 22nd. Russian-speaking Harvey Oswald didn't drive, and he didn't have a driver's license. Around 7.15, he walked the short distance from Ruth Payne's to Wesley Frazier's house in Irving, Texas, and rode with Frazier to the Texas Book Depository in Dallas, where he was employed. While Harvey was riding in Frazier's car, American-born Lee Oswald, wearing a white T-shirt, was seen in Oak Cliff, a suburb of Dallas. J.W. Dub Stark was the owner of the Top Ten Record Store located at 338 West Jefferson, across the street and a block and a half west of the Texas Theater. On December 3rd, FBI agent Carl Walters wrote a memo to the FBI's special agent in charge in Dallas. The memo stated, quote, On December 3rd, 1963, Mr. John D. Whitten telephonically advised that he heard Lee Harvey Oswald was in the Top Ten Record Shop on Jefferson on the morning of 11 63 Oswald bought a ticket of some kind and left. Then sometime later, Oswald returned to the record shop and wanted to buy another ticket. Close quotes. News reporter Earl Goltz confirmed this story in an interview with Dub Stark. The story was confirmed by top 10 record employee, store employee Louis Cortinas, also in an interview conducted by Earl Goltz. Around 8.30 a.m., while Harvey was working at the Texas Book Depository, Lee Oswald entered the Jiffy store at 310 South Industrial, a few blocks from the Book Depository. He took two bottles of beer to the counter. Fred Moore, the store clerk, asked Oswald for identification. Special Agent David Barry interviewed Moore on December 2nd. Barry wrote, Identification of this individual arose when he asked the young man for identification as proof of age for purchasing the two bottles of beer. Moore said he figured the man was over 21, but the store frequently requires proof by reason of past difficulties with local authorities for serving beer to minors. This customer said, sure, I got ID, and he pulled out the Texas driver's license from his billfold. Moore said that he noted the name appeared as Lee Oswald or possibly H. Lee Oswald. As Moore recalled, the birthday on the driver's license was 1939, and he thought it to have been the 10th month. Minutes before the assassination, seven eyewitnesses saw two men on the sixth floor of the Texas Book Depository. One of the men was wearing a white or light-colored shirt and the other a dark jacket or dark clothing. Most of these witnesses said the man wearing the white shirt looked like Lee Oswald. Several witnesses saw one of the men wearing a light-colored shirt holding a rifle with a scope. Across the street on the fifth and sixth floors of the county jail, as many as 40 inmates saw two men on the sixth floor fooling around with a scope on a rifle about six minutes before the assassination. Attorney Stanley Kaufman represented one of the inmates, Willie Mitchell, and advised the Warren Commission that numerous inmates witnessed the assassination and saw two men on the sixth floor. Kaufman always wondered why the Warren Commission never interviewed any of these witnesses. Mrs. Robert Reed was standing a few feet in front of the steps to the Texas School Book Depository when the shooting occurred. She then briefly spoke with the building superintendent, Roy Truly, and Texas Book Depository official O.V. Campbell before returning to her office on the second floor. As she entered the front door of her office, Mrs. Reed saw a man wearing a white T-shirt enter the office from the rear door. She recognized the young man as Lee Harvey Oswald and said he was carrying a Coke in his right hand. Oswald mumbled something to Mrs. Reed as he walked towards the front door of the office and then down the front stairs and out of the building. As Mrs. Reed was walking to the book depository, police officer Marion Baker got off his motorcycle, ran 45 feet to the front steps of the book depository, and began speaking with Roy Truly. Truly and Baker hurried through the main entrance, through the double doors, and into the floor, first floor warehouse. By this time, Lee Oswald, wearing a white T-shirt, and carrying a Coke, had already left the Texas Book Depository. Truly repeatedly pushed the button to call the West Freight Elevator. He gave up, and then he and Baker ran up the rear stairs. Baker emerged from the stairway onto the second floor and caught a glimpse of Harvey Oswald through the glass window in the hallway door. Baker drew his pistol and hollered, Come here. Harvey Oswald, wearing a brown button-down shirt, long sleeve, was confronted by Baker at arm's length. Warren Commission member Alan Dulles asked Baker, did he have a Coke? Baker replied, no, sir, no drink at all. 
After Mr. Turley told Baker that Oswald worked in the building, the two men left the lunchroom and continued running up the stairs. Harvey Oswald, wearing a brown, long sleeve brown shirt, walked down the rear stairs, picked up his gray jacket from the domino room, and began walking toward the main entrance. As he was preparing to leave the building, he was confronted by Pierce Allman and Terrence Ford, employees of WFAA-TV, who asked for the location of a telephone. Harvey Oswald, when questioned by Captain Fritz, said that he watched one of these men use the phone as he walked out the front entrance. Ruby knew and associated with Lee Oswald in the summer of 63, while Harvey and Marina were living in New Orleans. In October, a month before the assassination, a three-man musical combo was performing in Ruby's club that consisted of John Anderson, Bill Willis, and William Simmons. The small group worked only four hours a day, from 9 p.m. to 1 a.m. Curiously, Willis and Simmons lived 15 miles away from the Carousel Club in a house located 200 feet west of Ruth Payne's house. When Ruby shot Harvey Oswald, Nancy Powell, Tammy True, told the Warren Commission that she saw Bill Willis near the police station. Neither Willis nor Simmons were interviewed by the Warren Commission. Drummers and trumpet players working four hours a night are not rich. Why in the world would anyone working four hours a day as a drummer want to live 15 miles away in a suburb of Dallas in a house, in a rented house, not an apartment, not sharing an apartment, but a house. And this house just happens to be 200 feet from Ruth Payne's house. Now, my speculation, and it's speculation, is, you know, these guys were keeping an eye on Oswald at the request of Ruby. That's a, certainly a possibility. Okay, Harvey Oswald, wearing a long sleeve brown shirt, leaves Dealey Plaza. A few minutes after President Kennedy was shot, Harvey Oswald left the book depository. Harvey Oswald walked east on Elm Street and saw a city bus stopped in traffic as he was approaching Griffin Street. He walked to the bus and began pounding on the door. Driver, driver Cecil McWaters opened the door and allowed Harvey Oswald and a blonde woman to board the bus around 12.40 p.m. Now, Stuart Reed, a 30-year Army veteran, photographed Cecil McWater's bus a few blocks from the book depository at about the same time Harvey Oswald got on the bus. Reed was a U.S. government employee managing civilian employees under the auspices of the U.S. Army. He was photographing Oswald's bus. Why? The bus was soon stalled in traffic, and about four minutes later, Oswald got up from his seat, obtained a bus transfer, and left the bus via the front door. The blonde woman left the bus at the same time via the rear door. This blonde woman may have been following Oswald, may have followed him to Whaley's cab, and may have been the woman who asked Whaley to call a taxi for her. Harvey Oswald walked three blocks south of Lamar Street toward the Greyhound bus station and got into Whaley's cab. Whaley said he wasn't in any hurry. He wasn't nervous or anything. Oswald was wearing a dark brown button-up shirt, a T-shirt underneath, and a gray jacket. Stuart Reed took a second photograph of McWater's bus a few minutes later while the bus was stalled in traffic close to the Texas Book Depository. This was about the time two police officers boarded the bus looking for Harvey Oswald. Reed then took a photo of the sixth floor window of the Texas Book Depository before anyone knew that's where the shots came from. One hour later, Stuart Reed took several photos of Harvey Oswald as he was being arrested in Oak Cliff, taken by police from the Texas Theater in handcuffs. Stuart Reed took all of these photos which sequentially followed Oswald's movement within an hour and a half. Reed dropped his film off at a photo lab in Dallas and then hurried to New Orleans to catch a boat back to the canal zone. Prior to boarding the boat, Reed signed an authorization that allowed the FBI to pick up his developed photo slides in Dallas. The FBI told the Warren Commission that a government executive, Reed, answering to the military, took the photos. 
This seemed to satisfy the Warren Commission and Reed dropped out of sight without ever seeing his photos. The attempted murder of Harvey Oswald. Some of the brightest minds in the CIA planned the assassination of President Kennedy. The top level CIA officials like Angleton, Phillips, Hunt, Joannidis, and others could easily put together a hit team based on the Operation 40 group. And they were very experienced in creating a smoke and mirrors propaganda campaign and an evidentiary paper trail that would be easy for investigators like the Warren Commission to follow. The inescapable conclusion would thereby be that Oswald killed the president. A tremendous amount of time, money, and effort was put into setting up Harvey Oswald as the one and only patsy in the murder of President Kennedy. And these people could not afford to have their one and only suspect remain alive for very long with the real fear that he might start singing like a canary to the police. The longer Oswald was held in custody, the greater that risk became. They needed him dead as quickly as possible after he left the Texas Book Depository. But Harvey Oswald's destination, likely chosen by his handlers, was the Texas Theater. Following the assassination of President Kennedy, the killing of Harvey Oswald was the number one priority for the planners. This posed a serious problem because the planners were not on the ground. They had to rely on others to carry out this deed. Their worst nightmare would be if Harvey Oswald was arrested and began revealing details of his work as a spy, his false defection to the Soviet Union, his true identity, his place of birth, the Oswald's CIA project, his undercover work for the FBI, and his activities leading up to the assassination. If Oswald talked, he could not only demonstrate his innocence, but implicate others and the public would soon learn who was behind the coup d'etat that killed JFK. It appears the first attempt to kill Harvey Oswald may have been on a city bus driven by Cecil McWaters. Bus passenger Roy Milton Jones told the FBI that shortly after Oswald got off the bus, Harvey Oswald, two police officers boarded the bus and searched passengers for weapons. This was before anybody knew that Harvey Oswald had left the book depository. Why did two police search that particular bus? Because they knew Harvey Oswald was supposed to be on that bus. Who were these police officers? That's next. Stuart Reed again. If Oswald had been killed on the bus, can you imagine the value, the importance of Stuart Reed's photographs? He's got a photograph of Oswald at the time he gets on the bus. And then he's got a photograph minutes later of Oswald being shot and killed on the bus. If Oswald would have remained on that bus rather than gotten off the bus and caught a taxi, the chances are he would be dead, killed by those two police officers seen by Roy Milton Jones. Dallas Police Captain W.R. Westbrook. Captain W.R. Westbrook was in charge of personnel at Dallas Police Headquarters. He had his own office worked at a desk, and dressed in plain clothes. Westbrook's work on a day-to-day basis was more like a civilian than a police officer. Westbrook told the Warren Commission, quote, at the present time, I am personnel officer. We conduct all background investigations of applicants, both civilian and police. We investigate all personnel complaints, not all of them, but the major ones, end quote. Around 1231, one of those Dallas police dispatchers, Mrs. Kinney, came into Westbrook's office and told him shots had been fired at President Kennedy. Westbrook sent officers from his office, Sergeant Stringer and Carver, Joe Fields and McGee, to the Texas Book Depository Building. But why did Westbrook send his officers directly to the Texas Book Depository Building when all of the early police dispatches reported gunshots from the Grassy Mill area? Westbrook told the Warren Commission that he walked down the hall spreading the word and telling other people they needed to drive men down there to the book depository, and almost immediately everyone left. Westbrook said that he, quote, sat around a while and then began walking in civilian clothes one mile to the book depository, a 22-minute walk. Westbrook told the Warren Commission there wasn't a police car available to him. Yet Captain Westbrook 
could easily have asked the dispatcher to call a patrol car. He's a captain. Westbrook said that while walking to the Texas Book Depository, he stopped along the way to listen to transistor radio reports. Westbrook told the Warren Commission, after we, now, we is plural, not singular. After we reached the building, I contacted my sergeant, Sergeant Stringer, and he was standing in front, so I went in the building to help start the search. Start the search? This is near, you know, 25, 20, 25 minutes after the assassination. The search is already well underway. He said, I was on the first floor, and I'd walked down the aisle, opened the door to the outside loading dock, and when I came out on the dock, one of the men hollered and said there'd been an officer killed in Oak Cliff. Now, that's what Westbrook told the Warren Commission. Here's what I think, and the speculation. Westbrook's Warren Commission testimony aside, his whereabouts from the time he was seen at the police station around 1221, 1230, sorry, to his arrival at the Texas Book Depository, 115, 110, are unknown. His story of walking to the Book Depository after the President of the United States was shot is nearly impossible to believe. There's no proof whatsoever that Westbrook was ever in the Texas Book Depository. Not one police report, not one witness, nothing. But Westbrook's story about walking the book depository, which takes 20, 25 minutes, that story gave Westbrook an alibi to account for 40 to 50 minutes of his time. This is very important. Westbrook would like us to believe that he walked 22 minutes to the scene of President Kennedy's murder, but then hurriedly drove to the scene of Officer Tippett's murder. Now we've got one police captain who's missing for some 40 minutes. There's a second police officer, Reserve Officer Sergeant Kenneth Croy. Kenneth Croy was a federal reserve police officer, separated from his wife and living with his parents. Croy told the Warren Commission that when President Kennedy was shot, he was sitting in his car at the city hall, same location as Westbrook. Croy said that while driving his car home, he was hemmed in from both sides by traffic on Main and Griffin for about 20 minutes. He drove past the courthouse on Elm and asked police officers, he can't remember their names, if he could be of any assistance. Croy said that after the officer said no, that he proceeded to drive home. Croy would have us believe that he was told by these officers that his police services were not needed when many off-duty police officers were called at home and told to report for duty. And Croy testified that while at the courthouse, his estranged wife, quote, pulled up beside me, driving her car. And then the couple decided to go to lunch at Austin's Barbecue. But first, Croy said that he needed to change clothes at his parents' house. On the day of the assassination of President Kennedy, one of the most infamous days in American history, Sergeant Crow would like us to believe that his priorities were to drive to his parents' house, change clothes, and have lunch with his estranged wife. That's Croy's testimony. My speculation, Croy's Warren Commission testimony aside, his whereabouts from 1230 to 110 are unknown, just like Westbrook. His story of sitting in his car when the president was shot and getting hemmed in by traffic for 20 minutes gave an alibi to account for nearly three quarters of an hour of his time. Following is my speculation. I don't believe Westbrook walked to the Texas Book Depository. I don't believe he was in the Texas Book Depository. I don't believe that Croy spoke to police officers in front of the courthouse, had lunch with his wife, and then went home. I believe that Westbrook, accompanied by Croy, drove his unmarked dark blue police car to Dede Plaza. Westbrook and Croy boarded McWater's bus looking for Harvey Oswald, which was not reported to the Warren Commission nor investigated by the FBI or the Dallas police. Captain Westbrook may have been carrying a drop gun that could have been planted on Oswald if and when Oswald was shot and killed on the bus. If Harvey Oswald had been killed on the bus, Stuart Reed's photos of McWater's bus would have become very famous. But after failing to locate Harvey on the bus, I believe that Westbrook and Croy do drove a police car to Oak Cliff in an attempt to locate Harvey around 1255. Question, were Westbrook and Croy, the two police officers seen by Erling Roberts, driving past 1026 North Beckley about 1 to 1 o'clock? There's a lot there. I think this is just the tip of the iceberg of these two guys. 
Croy, and Westbrook. Lynn, it's not only the tip of the iceberg. If there's one thing that researchers should do, it's read Croy's testimony from the Warren Commission. After reading Croy's testimony to the Warren Commission, it's very obvious he, and this is my opinion, this is my speculation, they question him time and time again about what he was doing in the basement of the police department when Oswald was shot and killed. He was standing next to Jack Ruby. That was his testimony. Isn't that interesting? My speculation is it was Croy who let Ruby into the basement to kill Oswald. If Harvey Oswald was shot, was not shot and killed on McWater's bus, then the apparent backup plan was to murder Dallas police officer J.D. Tippett near Oswald's home in Oak Cliff, blame the murder on him, and expect that the police would shoot the cop killer on sight. Harvey Oswald's arrival at the Texas Theater was no accident. He was there because he was following orders. He was told to go to the Texas Theater. Harvey Oswald's moving from seat to seat within the darkened theater, as remembered by theater patron Jack Davis, indicates that he was looking for someone. After Harvey Oswald was arrested, the halves of two $1 bills were among the items taken from him. Half a dollar bill was a spy technique that allowed one agent to verify the identity of an unknown agent who produced the other half of the dollar bill. The murder of Dallas police officer Tippett appears to have been prearranged and involved Lee Oswald and at least two Dallas police officers who witnessed the shooting. After Lee Oswald shot and killed Tippett at Denton Patton, he likely met up with one of these police officers, Captain Westbrook. And Lee Oswald gave Westbrook his wallet, his white Eisenhower type jacket, and the 38 pistol that he used to kill Tippett. Lee Oswald then hurried to the Texas Theater, purchased a ticket, and ran upstairs to the balcony. Captain Westbrook told the Warren Commission that he heard about the Tippett shooting while he was at the book depository. Does Westbrook drive to the scene of Tippett's murder? No. He drives to a parking lot a block and a half from the murder scene. Why? It was in this parking lot that Westbrook, quote, found or planted a white Eisenhower type jacket that was allegedly thrown down by the suspect who shot Tippett. Westbrook identified the jacket to the police dispatcher at 1.25 p.m. and then drove to Tenton Patton. After he arrived at Tenton Patton, Westbrook produced a wallet complete with identification for Lee Oswald and Alec Idell, which he showed to fellow police officers and to FBI agent Robert Barrett. That wallet was filmed by WFAA television cameraman Ron Ryland. Now, thanks to Captain Westbrook, police officers at Tenton Patton knew the name of the suspect who apparently shot and killed Officer Tippett, and they had his white jacket. The wallet last seen in the hands of Captain Westbrook, soon disappeared and was never seen again. No police report, no FBI reports, no Warren Commission testimony, no HSCA testimony. This wallet proves that Captain Westbrook was complicit in the prearranged murder of Tippett and the framing of Harvey Oswald for the crime of murder. You know, his timetable is unbelievable up till then, and now they know who they're looking for. As taxi driver William Whaley drove south on Sang Boulevard, his taxi and passenger Harvey Oswald passed by Officer Tippett, who was observed by five witnesses sitting in his patrol car at the glucose station watching traffic. Tippett knew both Harvey and Lee. After driving past Tippett's patrol car, Whaley turned left on North Beckley and stopped at the 700 block near Neely Street about 12.54 p.m. Harvey Oswald got out of the taxi and began walking to his room house about three and a half blocks away. He arrived just before one o'clock and spent a few minutes changing his pants and his work shirt, his t-shirt, in his room. In my opinion, he left the book depository wearing a long sleeve brown shirt, which he would have left in the domino room. He's inside. He's working in his t-shirt. It's his t-shirt that gets dirty. That's what he changes at Beckley. He has no reason to change his long sleeve brown shirt. He does change his shirt. He changes his white T-shirt. He puts on his long sleeve brown shirt. That's the shirt he was rested in the Texas theater. Now, one final thing. By this time, people should notice, I'm sorry, not notice, but realize that Lee Oswald, from the time he was seen 
on the sixth floor of the book depository to the last time he was seen, and we'll get into that, is wearing a white T-shirt. That's Lee wearing a white T-shirt and the white Eisenhower-type jacket. Harvey is the brown shirt guy, the long sleeve brown shirt. So you've got white shirt, brown shirt. Very simple to follow these guys. White shirt, brown shirt. Lee in the white shirt. Harvey in the brown shirt. Now, Tippett, sitting in his patrol car at the Globo station, may have been waiting for Harvey Oswald to get off McWater's bus at the bus stop directly across the street. But when the bus failed to arrive on time, Tippett became alarmed, quickly left the Globo station, and began driving south on Lancaster. A minute or two later, at 12.54 p.m., Tippett reported his position as Lancaster and 8th. He then turned right on Jefferson Boulevard and drove two miles to the Top Ten Record Store. Tippett parked his patrol car, hurriedly entered the store, and asked store clerk Louis Cortinas for permission to make a phone call. Tippett said nothing during the call, hung up the phone, hurried out to his car, and drove north across Jefferson Boulevard about 1 p.m. A few minutes later, Erling Roberts saw a police car drive slowly past Harvey Oswald's rooming house at 1026 Beckley. I don't know if it was Tippett who drove past the rooming house or if it was Westbrook who cried. Anyway, Harvey Oswald was in a small room changing clothes and probably heard the honk honk of the patrol car around 1.03 p.m. Now, out of the thousands of houses in Oak Cliff, why would a police car drive slowly past Oswald's rooming house less than a half an hour after President Kennedy was shot and honk the horn only minutes after Harvey Oswald arrived? It's because the driver of the police car knew where to find Oswald. And that police officer was not going to arrest Oswald. Harvey Oswald left the rooming house wearing the dark brown long sleeve shirt and white t-shirt and was last seen by his landlady standing at the corner of Beckley and Zion around 1.04 p.m. He probably got into one of the police cars and two or three minutes later arrived in the alley behind the Texas Theater at 231 West Jefferson. That's only a mile, 1.2 miles away, a couple of minute drive. Harvey Oswald then walked, and this is important, sight unseen, from the alley behind the theater through a narrow passageway adjacent to the theater. He emerged on Jefferson Boulevard maybe 100 feet from the cashier. Nobody saw him. He purchased a ticket from Julia Postal and walked into the theater around 107 or 108. Concession attendant Butch Burroughs said that Oswald arrived between 1 and 107. Officer Tippett was shot around 108 or 109. A few minutes after Harvey Oswald arrived at the theater, Butch Burroughs sold the popcorn. There weren't that many people in the theater in the afternoon of November 22nd. If Oswald had snuck into the theater, it's pretty likely that Butch Burroughs would have known that he didn't buy a ticket. The fact that Burroughs sold him popcorn didn't raise an issue is a pretty good indication that Oswald, Harvey Oswald, wearing the brown shirt, did buy a ticket. Now we're going to talk about Lee Oswald, seen by Mrs. Reed carrying a coat and wearing a white T-shirt. Lee Oswald walked west on the Elm Street extension in front of the Texas Book Depository and waited. At 12.40 p.m., a light-colored Nash Rounder station wagon with a chrome luggage rack pulled over to the curb and stopped. Deputy Sheriff Roger Craig heard a shrill whistle, which attracted his attention, and watched as a young man wearing a white T-shirt walk over to the car and got in. Craig identified the man as Lee Harvey Oswald. Marvin Robinson was driving his Cadillac directly behind the Nash Rambler when it, the Rambler suddenly stopped. Robinson saw a white male hurry over to the car and get in. Robinson's employee, Roy Cooper, was following him in a different vehicle and also saw the same man hurry and get into the car. Both men told the FBI that the man who got into the Nash Rambler resembled, closely resembled Lee Harvey Oswald, but neither man was interviewed by the Warren Commission. Helen Forrest saw the man run towards the Nash Rambler again, and she said, quote, if it wasn't Oswald, it was his identical twin. Helen Forrest was never interviewed by the Warren Commission, nor was her statement published in the Warren volumes. The Nash Rambler was last seen driving under the triple overpass of Lee Oswald, who was wearing a white T-shirt. Before meeting up with Officer Tippett near 10th and Patton, Lee Oswald acquired a pistol and a light-colored medium-sized jacket that he wore over his white T-shirt. About 103, 
Lee Oswald was seen by several witnesses in the Oak Cliff suburb of Dallas, walking west near the corner of 10th Street and Marcellus, more than a mile south of Harvey Oswald's rooming house. Lee Oswald was only three blocks north of Jack Ruby's apartment, where he had been seen the night before by Helen McIntosh, a guest of Ruby's next-door neighbor. Now, that's important. I talked to Helen McIntosh, and the evening of November 21st, a man knocks on the door. Helen's staying with her friend. And this, this small room, apartment, if you want to call it, is next door to Jack Ruby's. This man knocks on the door. Helen McIntosh answers the door, and he asks for Jack. And Helen looks at him and says, uh, just a minute. He turns around and asks her friend, do you know Jack? He lives next door. Okay. So he told Helen told the young man he lived next door. Well, Helen said that man was identical to Lee Harvey Oswald. Well, once again, and Lee Oswald and Jack Ruby together, just like they were in the Lucas B&B restaurant three hours later, together, when Harvey Oswald and his wife are over in Irving, Texas, at Ruth Payne's house that evening. Four blocks away from Ruby's apartment, and only one block east of Penta and Patton, one block, was a small single-story house at 511 East Tent that was owned by attorney Dick Loomis Sr. and his wife. Mrs. Loomis was a housewife and president of the Oak Cliff Fine Arts Club. She told FBI agents Griffin and Carter that a young couple who were identical to Lee Harvey and Maria Oswald lived next door in an apartment complex at 507 East 10th, about one week before the assassination. Mrs. Loomis saw Marina and her infant child in front of her home and recalled that Marina had jet black hair. She said Marina wore very plain clothing. On one occasion, wore a light blouse and a plaid skirt, and on another occasion, a dark blouse and the same plaid skirt. Now, we need to keep in mind that Marina had two children at that time. She just gave birth to Rachel. June, of course, was about two years old at the time, born in Russia. All right, Mrs. Loomis once saw a heavy set man visit the apartment next door and thought it may have been Ruby. FBI agent James Hostie, who never met Oswald face-to-face -face prior to November 22nd, told fellow FBI agent Carver Gayton that he left notes under Oswald's apartment door. But the Warren Commission reported that Oswald lived either at his rooming house or at Ruth Payne's house, neither of which was an apartment. Hostie could not have left notes at Oswald's rooming house or at Ruth Payne's but he could have left notes under the door at several of Lee Oswald's previous apartments, including 507 East 10th, 1106 Diceman Avenue, or an apartment located in Oak Cliff that Ruby rented for Oswald. That was according to Dallas Police Informant T-1. Mr. Clark worked as a barber at the Ted Street Barber Shop, two blocks north of Jack Ruby's apartment. Mr. Clark may have been the first person to see Lee Oswald walking west on 10th Street, four blocks east of 10th and Patton. FBI agent Carl Underhill reported, quote, on the morning of 11 63 Clark had seen a man whom he would bet his life on was Oswald passing his barbershop in a great hurry, and he commented on this fact to a customer in the chair. Lee Oswald walked past Town & Country Cafe, across Marcellus Avenue, and continued walking west on 10th. William Lawrence Smith, working on a project one block east of 10th and Patton, began walking east towards the town and country cafe for lunch shortly after 1 o'clock. Smith said, quote, he felt sure the man who walked by him going west on 10th Street was Lee Harvey Oswald. Tile workers James Archer and Jimmy Brewer were seeing an Archer's pickup truck on the southeast corner of 10th and Denver. Brewer saw the same man walking west on 10th Street. Jimmy Burt was across the street from the construction site where Smith was working and watched the same man as he continued walking west. Burt described the man, Lee Oswald, as a white male, approximately 5'8", wearing a light short jacket. Burt said he, quote, caught a glimpse of the shooter, but was, quote, never closer than 50 to 60 yards to this man. William Arthur Smith was a bit with Bird at the time and described the same man as a white male wearing a white shirt, light brown jacket, and dark pants. 
Both Bert and Smith watched the Sunburn net as he continued walking west on 10th Street towards Patton. They saw a black police car driving east and pulled slowly over to the curb. The young man casually walked over to the police car and began speaking with the officer through the passenger window. This is around 1.06 p.m. After the assassination, Bert and Smith were shown Harvey Oswald's photograph, and both men said this was not the man who shot him. Taxi driver William Scoggins was sitting in his taxi at the corner of Tenth and Patton eating lunch as Tippett in his police car passed by him driving east. Scoggins recognized the driver and told the Warren Commission, quote, just used to see him every day. As Tippett stopped and parked his vehicle in front of a small driveway at 410 East 10th, Scoggins saw a young man walking west on 10th Street. He watched the man approach the police car. Scoggins told the Warren Commission the young man was wearing a light-colored jacket, a white shirt, and dark trousers. As Lee Oswald, wearing the white T-shirt, began talking with Tippett, he was carrying a concealed weapon, a 38 revolver. Harvey Oswald, in the brown shirt, was seven-tenths of a mile west inside the Texas Theater, and he was also carrying a 38 revolver. Harvey Oswald arrived at the theater around 101 to 107, 108, and almost certainly purchased a ticket from Julia Postal. Jones Harris, a longtime assassination investigator, arrived in Dallas the day after the assassination. Harris interviewed Julia Postal in the office of the manager of the Texas Theater. Harris asked Postal if she sold ticket to the man arrested in the theater by Dallas police. Postal immediately burst into tears. Harris walked out of the office and returned a short time later. When Harris asked Postal again if she sold Harvey Oswald a ticket, she burst into tears. Harris was convinced that Postal knew that Julia sold Harvey Oswald a ticket. Butch Burroughs told Texas researcher Jim Mars that Julia Postal knows she sold a ticket to Harvey Oswald. Harvey Oswald purchased popcorn from Burroughs around 115 and then returned to the lower level and took a seat next to a pregnant woman. Within a few minutes, both Oswald and the woman got up from their seats. Harvey Oswald walked to the concession area and then back into the lower level and took a seat next to Jack Davis in the first row on the right side. Davis remembered that Oswald was sitting next to him in the near empty theater as the opening credits to the movie began a few minutes before 1.20 p.m. After sitting next to Davis for a few minutes, Oswald got up and walked past empty seats to the small aisle on the right side of the theater and back into the concession area. Davis watched Oswald as he again re-entered the theater and took a seat next to a man on the back row directly across the aisle from Davis. Within a few minutes, Harvey Oswald got up and once again returned to the concession area. He returned a few minutes later and took a seat across the aisle from Mr. Davis and then moved to another seat on the fourth row. It appeared to Davis as though Harvey Oswald was looking for someone, perhaps a contact. Now, once again, that after his arrest, the police found two halves of two different dollar bills in Harvey Oswald's wallet. This is a method of spycraft. Wherever and whenever Oswald met his contact, this person would provide confirmation of his identity with the other half of these dollar bills. Now, curiously, neither of these items were listed on the police inventory of November 23rd, the joint FBI Dallas Police Inventory of November 26th, nor were they photographed. At the National Archives in Adelphi, Maryland, I inspected and handled each item of inventory listed on the FBI DPD inventory of 1126. These items were not among the inventory. The only indication of these items is from the Dallas police files. Butch Burroughs saw Harvey Oswald sitting next to one person, a pregnant lady, and both got up from their seats only minutes apart. Question, why would a pregnant woman watch a war movie at 1.15 on a Friday afternoon? How likely is that? And why and how did this pregnant woman leave the theater just before police arrived? Rose remembered that prior to the police arriving, this pregnant lady went to the restroom in the balcony and was never seen again. Could this woman have been Harvey Oswald's contact in the theater?
perhaps. Lee Oswald, an officer, Tippett, had a friendly conversation. No question about that. Officer Tippett lived with his wife and family at 238 Glencairn, seven miles south of 10th and Patton, and he patrolled Area 78 in South Oak Cliff. On November 22nd, Tippett was in the area of Central Oak Cliff in Patrol District 91 assigned to Officer William Mensel. He was several miles from his assigned district. Now, what I'm going to tell you now is very curious and extremely suspicious. Several of the people who witnessed the shooting of Officer Tippett near 10th and Patton either knew him or were familiar with him, even though Tippett was many miles from his assigned patrol area. Witness Jimmy Burke recognized Tippett, quote, as an officer who frequented the neighborhood. Burke said, quote, this particular officer was known by the name of friendly to the residents of the area. Witness William Stoggins, the taxi driver, said, quote, I wasn't paying too much attention to the man, you see. Just used to see him every day. Witness Akila Clements told researcher Mark Lane she saw Tippett all the time. Why was Tippett known to residents living near Tenth and Patton when his assigned district was seven miles away? Tippett's familiarity to local residents could be understood by the Warren Commission testimony of Virginia Davis, who lived in the house next door to where Tippett was shot and killed. Virginia Davis was asked by Commission Attorney David Bellin, where was the police car parked? Davis answered, and this is very important, it was parked between the hedge that marks the apartment house where he lives in and the house next door. I'm going to repeat that, and I'm going to give you the addresses of these two houses. It was parked between the hedge that marks the apartment where he lived in, that's Fort Tenney's tent, and the house next door, which is the house next door to Virginia Davis, 404 East Tent. According to Virginia Davis's testimony, Officer Tippett was living in the house at 410 East 10th. If Tippett lived in this house, it was actually a duplex 410 408 East 10th, or was having an affair with a woman living in this house, Johnny Maxie Thompson, this would explain not only Tippett's familiarity with the local, to the local residents, but it could also explain a familiar location where he could meet up with Lee Oswald and fellow co-conspirators. Lee Oswald meeting Tippett at this precise location at this precise time was not an accident. Their meeting was pre-planned. While well, Harvey Oswald, the brown shit, was sitting in the dark in the Texas theater with a loaded 38 revolver, Tippett was driving west on 10th Street. Witnesses in the 500 block of East 10th saw the shooter walking west towards 10th and Patton. But witness Helen Markham standing on the corner of 10th and Patton told the Warren Commission the shooter was walking in the same direction as the police car was driving east. Lee Oswald could easily have walked past 410 East 10th, where Tippett lived. And when he did not see Tippett's police vehicle, he just may have continued walking west. When he saw Tippett's police car in the distance, maybe he turned around and walked back to the address where, where Tippett lived. Tippett still drove his police car to the curb and stopped directly in front of the narrow driveway at 404 East 10th. Now, this driveway is between the houses at 404 and 4 East 10th, which is next door to Virginia Davis at 400 East 10th. This small driveway, a very small driveway, led from 10th Street straight back to the alley behind the two houses. This is very narrow. Tippett may have intentionally parked his car directly in front of this narrow driveway because if a vehicle turned onto the driveway from the alley, Tippett would have seen the approaching vehicle immediately. And I believe this is why Tippett parked directly in front of that narrow driveway. Lee Oswald casually approached the police car and began talking with Tippett through the passenger side car window. It appears that Tippett and Lee Oswald were talking quietly, passing the time while waiting for somebody to arrive. Jack Roy Tatum was driving east on 10th Street in his new red Ford Fairlane. As he approached the squad car, 
Tippett noticed a young white male with both hands in the pocket of his zippered jacket leaning over the passenger side window of the squad car. Tatum said, quote, It looked as if Oswald and Tippett were talking to each other. It was almost as if Tippett knew Oswald. Of course they knew each other. Lee Oswald was the same man Tippett sat next to at the Dobbs restaurant two days early on Wednesday, November 20th, while Harvey Oswald was working at the book depository. Tatum said he had on a light-colored zipper jacket, dark trousers, and what looked like a T-shirt. Where's the brown shirt? The brown shirt is on Harvey Oswald at the uh, Texas Theater. Within a few minutes of when Oswald and Tippett began talking, a second police vehicle emerged from the alley and began driving slowly on the narrow driveway towards Tippett's car. The second police car was seen by Mrs. Holland, who lived directly across the street from where Tippett's patrol car was parked. As the second police car stopped between the two houses, 404 and 410 East End, Lee Oswald stood up and slowly backed away from Tippett's patrol car. Officer Tippett got out of his car and began walking around the front of the car towards the second police car, probably expecting to meet the officers inside the police car. Unknown to Tippett, he had only seconds to live. As Tippett walked near the front of his patrol car, Lee Oswald pulled his pistol and fired three shots. After Tippett fell to the ground, Lee Oswald walked to the back of Tippett's patrol car. He then stopped, returned to where Tippett was laying, and deliberately shot Tippett in the head. Could Captain Westbrook, who got out of the unmarked police car at the same time, have said something like, finish the job, or something similar? That could have caused Lee Oswald to stop, turn around, and retace his steps and then shoot Tippett in the head with a fourth shot. Jack Tatum saw the fourth shot and said, quote, whoever shot Tippett was determined that he shouldn't live, and he was determined to finish the job. JFK researcher Shirley Martin, she heard tape recorded an interview with Akil Clemens in August 1964. Mrs. Clemens told Shirley that while sitting on her porch, she saw two men standing near the police cruiser moments before Tippett was shot. Mrs. Doris Holden lived on the second floor at 409 East 10th across the street. Mrs. Holden just returned home from her job a few minutes after one when she heard several gunshots. From her second floor bedroom window, she had possibly the best view of the murder scene and saw Tippett lying on the street near the left front of his patrol car. Mrs. Holden observed the shooter as he was walking across Davis's lawn towards Patton. Mrs. Holland also noticed a second police car parked in the narrow driveway between the houses at 404 and 410 East Tip. Tippett's car was parked on 10th Street, directly in front of the narrow driveway, and prevented the second police car from driving onto 10th Street. Now, the second police car drove on a narrow alleyway between Jefferson Boulevard and 10th Street, and then turned onto the small narrow driveway between 404 and 410 East 10th. This police vehicle then stopped on the narrow driveway between the two houses where it could not be seen by most witnesses to the shooting. But Mrs. Holen, from directly across the street, did see the second police vehicle. And both she and Akita Clemens saw two men at the scene of the shooting. And one of those men came from the second police vehicle. The location of the second police vehicle parked between the two houses on a very narrow, narrow driveway was no accident. The precise location of this vehicle and the precise timing of its arrival is the best indication that Tippett's murder was pre-planned and involved both Lee Oswald and the occupants of the second police vehicle. Seconds after the shots were fired, Mrs. Holden saw a man, probably Captain Westbrook, emerge from the second police car and walk towards Tippett's body lying in the street, apparently to see if he was still alive or dead. In 1990, a resident of the neighborhood was interviewed by JFK researcher Professor Bill Pulte on the condition of anonymity. This resident said that he heard that a man walked down the driveway and approached Tippett just after the shooting. In January 1968, Playboy magazine interviewed Jim Garrison. A reader wrote to Playboy and said, quote, 
I read Playboy's Garrison interview with perhaps more interest than most readers. I was an eyewitness to the shooting of policeman Tippett in Dallas on the afternoon President Kennedy was murdered. I saw two men, neither of them resembling the pictures I later saw of Lee Harvey Oswald, shoot Tippett and her off in different directions. There were at least half a dozen other people who witnessed this. From her second floor bedroom window, Mrs. Holden hurried downstairs to the first floor and outside the house. She watched the man standing beside Tippett as he began to retrace his path up the driveway while the second police car backed up into the alley. The second police vehicle quickly and quietly left before witnesses began to arrive at the scene. Sam Ginyard, who worked at the Harris Motor Company directly south and across the alley from Virginia and Barbara Davis's home, saw the second police car. In 1970, Ginyard told JFK researcher Michael Brownlow that he saw a police car in the alley shortly after Tippett was shot. After the shooting, the second occupant of the police car, Sergeant Kenneth Croy, remained at 10th and Patton and was seen moments later by Virginia Davis. Captain Westbrook quickly left the scene, briefly met up with Lee Oswald, and then drove the police vehicle back to the Texas Book Depository. Westbrook and Croy occupants of the second police car were co-conspirators whose involvement and manipula manipulation of evidence will be explained further. Now, let me say at this point, I don't have any proof that it was Croy and Westbrook in that police car. All we have is Mrs. Holden saying that there was a police car outside. She did see a man get out of the police car, look at Tippett, back up to the police car. The man was wearing a suit. Mrs. Marchie Higgins, a neighbor of Mrs. Holden, who lived at 417 East 10th, said, quote, Well, I was watching news on television, and for some reason the announcer turned and looked at the clock and said the time was six minutes after one. At that point, I heard the shots. Mrs. Higgins described the shooter and said he was definitely not the man they showed on television. Mrs. Higgins called the police. James Archer and Jimmy Brewer, sitting in Archer's pickup, heard gunshots and soon saw Tippett laying in the street. Shortly after 1 o'clock, Masons Francis Kenneth and Albert Austin were working on a scaffold on a construction project when they heard gunshots. Both men heard shots, saw a policeman laying on the ground, and watched the man run from the scene and turn south on Patton. Kins was shown a photograph of Oswald and said that he could not identify him as being the individual he observed leaving the scene of the Tippett shooting. After hearing gunshots, Jimmy Burt and William Arthur Smith quickly ran towards Burt's 1952 Ford, which was parked on Denver Street, near 10th Street, facing south. They jumped into the car and within a minute arrived in the front of Tippett's patrol car. They arrived so quickly, they saw Lee Oswald walking south near the corner of 10th and Patton with a gun in his right hand. Virginia Davis, at 400 East 10, heard shots and looked out the screen door of her home. As Lee Oswald was cutting across the front yard of her house, he removed empty shell casings from his gun and tossed them on the ground. Virginia Davis' statement, you can never interpret or understand what they're saying unless you've got a very deep understanding and knowledge of the events around it. For example, and it's one set, it's just a couple of words in one set. Virginia Davis told the Warren Commission when they asked where Tippett's car was, by the hedge next to the house where he lives. Three words, where he lives. Those three words are enough to change everything. When you put that together with the fact that um, several witnesses knew him. These people knew him. They saw him get shot, and they knew him. How many police officers do you know driving in your neighborhood? There's a reason for that. The reason is he had, Tippett had to have been in the area enough for people to have gotten used to him, knew him as officer-friendly or whatever. So those three words, the house he lived in, is a pretty good indication that Tippett was around that area a lot. Virginia Davis told the Warren Commission that the policeman 
was already there after he, the shooter, disappeared around the corner. This was only seconds after the shooting. Virginia said, we ran out in the front yard and down to see what had happened. The policeman was likely Officer Sergeant Kenneth Croy, who accompanied Westbrook in the second police car seen by Mrs. Holman. Croy was the only police officer at the Tippett murder scene before the ambulance arrived. And Sergeant Croy was the only officer who said he saw Tippett being loaded into the ambulance. If the police officer seen by Virginia Davis was not Croy, then who was it? Now, Lee Oswald leaves Tenth and Patton. Domingo Benavides, who was sitting in his truck on the opposite side of the street facing Tippett's car, watched Oswald as he left the scene. Benavides remembered, quote, the back of his head seemed like his hairline sort of went square instead of tapering off. His hair didn't taper off. It kind of went down and squared off. Harvey Oswald's hairline, as we know from numerous pictures and photographs taken at the police station, extended well down his neck and past his collar line. It was not squared off, as described by Benavides. I want to talk a minute about Reserve Officer Sergeant Kenneth Croy. Croy told the Warren Commission that he was driving his car in downtown Dallas when he heard the shooting of the president over his police radio. Minutes after the shooting, while driving past the courthouse, Croy saw police officers and asked if they needed any help. According to Croy, these police officers said no. Croy said that he and his estranged wife drove up beside him in her car and asked if he wanted to get something to eat. They agreed to meet at Austin's barbecue in Oakland. This was Croy's testimony, but it makes no sense. Croy was unable to identify the police officers who were standing in front of the courthouse. Croy said nothing about the large crowds in and around the courthouse, less than a block from the Texas Book Depository on the most famous day in Dallas history. Why would police officers decline Croy's offer to help when police officers were being called at home and asked to return to duty? Why would Croy, as a strange wife, agree to meet for lunch only a few minutes after President Kennedy had been shot? Croy's testimony makes no sense, but it does give him an alibi that helps to mask and keep secret his activities and his involvement in the murder of Officer Tippett. At the murder scene, Croy told the Warren Commission that while driving on Zang Boulevard, he heard about the Tippett shooting over the police radio. Croy said that he was the first police officer to arrive at the scene of Tippett's murder. After arriving, he saw Tippett being loaded into the ambulance. However, Virginia Davis said the police was there just after the shooter threw empty shells in the ground around South on Patton. Croy said that he then stood next to Tippett's patrol car and interviewed a witness for 10 minutes but could not remember her name. In fact, Croy could not remember the name of a single witness, nor could he remember the name of any police officer. Foreign Commission testimony. Were you at the scene where Tippett was there? Yes. Unassigned? Yes. I see. Now, I'm just referring to the street you found him on. When you got there, was Tippett's car there? Yes. Was Tippett there? They were loading him in at the ambulance. Were other officers at the scene? None that I saw. How many police officers came out onto the scene of the Tippett killing while you were there? I don't know. There was a slew of them. That would be hard to say. Were there any officers that you knew? There were several officers that I knew. I don't know their names. There was a woman standing across the street from me. I don't recall her name. She gave me her name at that time. Well, how long did you talk with her? Oh, a good five or ten minutes. This conversation all took place near the scene of the Tippett killing? Leaning up against the police car, up against his car. Do you know the name of the woman you talked to across the street? I don't recall. I think she lives across the street. She was standing out in front watering her yard or doing something in her yard. Well, you see that she was watering her yard, well, or something. She was standing in her front yard doing something. But the first thing you indicated, the first thing you indicated was that she was watering her yard. Apparently, that was something that struck you, talking to her. I don't remember what she said she was doing. She was doing something in the yard, and I presume that is where she lived, was across the street. Now, how convenient that Croy just happened to be the first officer at the scene to the shooting some 10 minutes before any other police officers arrived. Croy's presence at 10th and Patton is best explained 
by the arrival of the second police car seen by Mrs. Holland. Coy testified before the Warren Commission. However, most of the Warren Commission's questions related to Coy's presence and his activities in the basement of the Dallas police station when Harvey Oswald was shot and killed by Jack Ruby. In my opinion, it was likely Croy who helped Ruby gain entrance to the basement so that he could kill Oswald. Let me summarize what I think was the involvement of Croy and Westbrook. It's very possible and likely that Croy was in the second police vehicle parked between the two houses, 404 and 410 East 10, that was seen by Mrs. Holland. It is very possible and likely that Dallas Police Captain Westbrook, wearing plain clothes, was the man who got out of the police vehicle and walked over to Tippett in order to confirm that Tippett was dead. Captain Westbrook returned to the police vehicle, backed up into the alley, while Reserve Officer Croy remained at the scene. After watching Lee Oswald hurry across their lawn, Virginia Davis, her sister-in-law, left their home and stood beside Tippett, while Sergeant Croy was, quote, already there. As the police vehicle backed up in their alley, it was seen by Sam Kinyard, who worked for Harris Motor Company across the alley from the Davises' home. Westbrook likely drove the second police vehicle a half a block south of Jefferson Boulevard and then turned right and drove towards the Texas Theater five blocks west. Westbrook likely met or picked up Lee Oswald near the Texaco station and may have driven into the Texas Theater. Now, Captain Westbrook meeting Lee Oswald within minutes of the Tippett shooting would explain Westbrook's possession of three very important items given to him by Lee Oswald. A light-colored, medium-sized Eisenhower-type jacket that was supposedly found later by Westbrook under a car at the Texaco station. The second Oswald wallet, which Westbrook soon produced at the Tippett murder scene, and the 38 revolver that Lee Oswald used to kill Tippett. Following the shooting of Tippett around 108-19, Westbrook rode his unmarked police car to the Texas Book Depository and then waited for the police dispatcher to broadcast information about the shooting. As Sergeant Croy looked on, Tippett's body was loaded into the ambulance around 1.12 p.m by Clayton Butler and Eddie Kinsey, driven to a nearby Methodist hospital, where he was pronounced dead on arrival, by Dr. LaCoria at 115. Among the items removed from Tippett at the hospital and taken to the police station was, quote, one black billfold. At 1.22 p.m., Dallas Police Officer J.M. Poe arrived and said, quote, there are already 100 to 200 people around there, and the ambulance had already left. Benavides gave two empty shell casings and an empty cigarette package to Poe. We must wonder why Benavides did not give the two shell casings to Croy, that Croy was the first officer at the scene, if he stayed at the scene, which I don't believe he did. Helen Markham provided Poe with the description of the shooter, which he immediately passed on to the Dallas Police Dispatcher, who reported, quote, last scene about the 300 block East Jefferson, He's white male, wearing a white jacket, white shirt, dark slacks. Dallas police officers began to question witnesses as more and more onlookers gathered. We will soon learn that a wallet containing identification for Lee Harvey Oswald and Alec Heidel was allegedly found at the Tippett murder scene by Cry, who claims that he then gave the wallet to Captain Westbrook. But not one witness, not one ambulance driver, not one neighbor, not one onlooker, and not one trained police officer saw a wallet lying on the ground or in Tippett's car. One of the first witnesses at the scene was Ted Calloway, who said, quote, I'll tell you one thing, there's no billfold at that scene. If there was, there would have been too many people who would have seen it. Now, we can now understand that Croy's testimony about asking police officers if they needed assistance in Dealey Plaza was nonsense. Croy was not driving his car near 10th and Patton when he heard about the Tippett shooting. Croy likely arrived at 10th and Patton with Captain Westbrook in the police car that was seen by Mrs. Holland. He remained at the scene of the crime after Westbrook left in the police car. And Croy was the officer seen by Virginia Davis after she walked from her porch to Tippett's police car 
and watched him laying on the ground. By claiming he was the first and only officer at the scene, could claim that he found or was given a wall at the murder scene before witnesses arrived. Croy should have been asked why he didn't give the wallet to any of the two dozen regular police officers and detectives who arrived at the scene. There were many police officers there by 1.15, 1 1.20. Westbrook didn't arrive until 20 minutes later. Croy should have been asked why he held on to the wallet for half an hour before giving the wallet to Westbrook, who didn't arrive till 1.40. In my opinion, Croy never saw the second wallet nor had the wallet in his possession at any time. Westbrook got the wallet from Oswald after the shooting. After talking with witness Ted Callaway, Patrolman Summers reported that he had, quote, an eyeball witness to the getaway man. The suspect was described as having black wavy hair, wearing an Eisenhower type jacket of light color, dark trousers, and a white t-shirt. He was, quote, apparently armed with a 32 dark finish automatic pistol, which he had in his right hand. However, if an automatic pistol was used to kill Tippett, three of the spent shell casings would have been ejected at the point where Oswald began shooting Tippett and would have landed on 10th Street, near the passenger side of Tippett's car. After Oswald shot Tippett in the head at point-blank range, the last shell casing would have been ejected onto the pavement on 10th Street, which it was not. Barbara and Virginia Davis, however, watched Oswald as he crossed in front of their yard Use his right hand to shake empty shells from an open revolver into his left hand. Two shell casings were removed near a bush in the Davis' side yard, about 50 to 60 feet from the front of Tippett's squad car, where the shots were fired. No question he was shot with a revolver, a six-shooter revolver, and not a pistol, not a semi-automatic pistol. Now, the next part, and probably the last part of this segment, will be about Lee Oswald arriving at the Texas Theater. Johnny Brewer has long been an important part of Oswald's arrival at the Texas Theater. Now, unraveling the truth about what happened is detailed, and it's not easy to follow. But I can assure you that Johnny Brewer did not see the man with the brown shirt at his store or anywhere near his store. But I will say it was Tommy Rowe. Tommy Rowe is the central figure in understanding how and why the police went to the Texas theater. Tommy Rowe was a close friend of Jack Ruby's. Tommy Rowe worked with Johnny Brewer in the shoe store. It was Tommy Rowe who pointed out Oswald in the brown shirt to the police sitting in the Texas theater, not Johnny Brewer. It's obvious to me that Lee Oswald's prearranged assignment was to kill Officer Tippett, which he did by intentionally shooting him in the head, and then lead police to the Texas theater where Harvey Oswald was sitting in the dark theater with a loaded 38 revolver. Tippett's murder would soon be blamed on Harvey Oswald, based on identification found in a wallet that suddenly appeared in the hands of Captain Westbrook at 10th and Patton. Identifying Harvey Oswald as the killer of Officer Tippett would give Dallas police ample justification to shoot Harvey Oswald on sight, especially if he was carrying a loaded revolver. But through the years, I've always wondered about two issues. Issue number one, how could the conspirators be absolutely sure that employees of the Texas theater would call the police. And how could they be sure the police would respond immediately to a young man who simply snuck into a movie theater when their focus and attention was on the assassination of President Kennedy, the shooting of Texas Governor John Connolly, and the murder of Officer Tippett? Why would the police care about a person who snuck into a theater without buying a 90 cent ticket? So the conspirators needed to make absolutely sure that the police would be called and that they would go to the Texas theater. Here's where Johnny Brewer comes in. It was Johnny Brewer who raised such a commotion about a, quote, suspicious man sneaking into the theater that theater cashier Julia Postal finally called the police at 1.44 p.m. But Julia was not the only person who called the police. JFK researcher Leo Savage 
asked Dallas Assistant District Attorney Jim Bowie whether a telephone call placed by Julia Postal had led to Oswald's arrest. Bowie told him there was a call from the cashier, but there all, were also half a dozen other calls. Someone wanted to make sure the police would respond to a suspicious person hiding inside the Texas theater. Now, the second issue is more important, and it's a timeline. Tibbet was shot at 1.06, 1.08 p.m., and it's only an eight to nine minute walk to the Texas theater. Why would the police not call until a half an hour later? What happened during that time? Almost 40 minutes has always bothered me. It's been on my mind for 20 years. Now, I was not the first to wonder about these missing minutes. In 1964, Commission Attorney Wesley Liebler wrote the following memo, quote, At first I was surprised to learn that Johnny Calvin Brewer knew that a patrolman had been shot when Oswald walked past his place of business less than eight blocks from the point of the tip of killing where Oswald apparently left as fast as he could. In other words, Oswald shot Tippett, and eight blocks later, a minute later, Brewer sees a suspicious guy outside the shoe store. He's already heard on the radio that a policeman has been shot. That's impossible. There's no way in the world that a radio station could broadcast the shooting of a policeman in the time it takes for an assailant to run eight blocks. Anyway, Wesley Lieber said, then I was surprised to learn that the police radio did not send out information about the suspect being at the Texas Theater until 1.45, about 30 minutes after the, first, the police first learned of the tippet shooting from Benavides over Tippett's radio. What were Oswald and Brewer doing during this 30 minutes? Oswald was strangely inactive during this period, considering all that he'd done the 45 minutes following the assassination. I believe that after killing Tippett, Lee Oswald met up with Captain Westbrook. Oswald gave Westbrook his jacket, his wallet, and his 38 revolver. Now, this is speculation. Lee Oswald, when he entered the theater, was now wearing a white T-shirt and dark trousers, not a long, dark brown, long sleeve shirt as reported by Johnny Burr. Lee Oswald should have brought the Texas theater eight to nine minutes after the shooting of Tippett. 117, 118, 120. Less than 10 minutes after Tippett was shot and killed, I believe that Captain Westbrook had position, possession of Oswald's jacket, his wallet, and the 38 revolver used to kill Tippett. We will soon learn that Westbrook did everything he could to distance himself from the jacket. We will also learn that the wallet produced by Westbrook and shown to officers at 10th and Patton disappeared. Lee Oswald also gave his 38 revolver that he used to murder Tippett to Westbrook. If Johnny Brewer had followed Lee Oswald wearing a white t-shirt and dark trousers from his store to the theater, as he claimed, then Julia Poston would have called the police around 120, 125. The police would arrive within a few minutes, just as they did after being notified by Julia Postal at 144. They arrived quickly. But I don't believe Johnny Brewer's story. I don't believe Brewer saw either Harvey Oswald or Lee Oswald walk past his store on Jefferson Boulevard. I believe that Lee Oswald, wearing a white t-shirt and dark trousers, walked through the theater after killing Tippett and arrived around 120. Lee Oswald has just shot and killed a Dallas policeman. He certainly didn't want to attract attention by sneaking into a movie theater. So he bought a 90 cent ticket from Postal, as did Harvey, around 107. He walked into the theater and up the stairs in the balcony. He's missing 25 minutes that Wesley Lieberman knew about, and I came upon years later, begins at 1.20 p.m. If a Dallas radio station broadcasts a description of the suspect at 1.30, their only source of information was police radio broadcasts. The police reported that Tippett's cutter was 5'8", white shirt, white jacket, dark socks. But Johnny Brewer told Julia Postal and the Warren Commission, the man he saw sneak into the theater, was wearing a long sleeve brown shirt, not a white shirt, not a light colored jacket as reported by the police. Brewer also said this man was acting suspicious and appeared to be scared outside his store at 1.30. But Brewer's description of Oswald's clothing did not match what the police broadcast said. And Brewer's description of Oswald acting scared 
did not match police observations of Harvey Oswald after he was arrested. Police officer said Oswald was calm and showed no signs of being scared. This author believes that 25 minutes are the result of Brewer needing to wait to hear about the murder of a policeman on the radio. After hearing the description of the suspect, Brewer could then approach Julia Postal, tell him that a suspicious man had snuck into the theater and insist that she had called the police. Brewer never explained how he was able to identify the suspect wearing a white t-shirt and white jacket, according to the radio, as the same man who appeared in front of his store wearing a long sleeve dark brown shirt. And according to the Dallas radio stations, information about the tippet shooting was first broadcast at 1.51, long after Brewer claimed to have heard it on the radio. At 1.35, Julie Post was listening to KLIF radio and heard the official announcement that President Kennedy was dead. Julie said Johnny Brewer appeared shortly after she heard the news of Kennedy's death. Brewer asked Julie if she'd sold a ticket to a man who was wearing a brown shirt, and she replied, what man? Now, how could Johnny Brewer know about a man wearing a long sleeve brown shirt, Harvey Oswald, when that man had been sitting in the theater since 1 o'clock, a half an hour earlier? So, Foreign Commission Attorney asked Brewer, well, would you state what happened? You said you saw him walk into the Texas theater? Brewer, he walks into the Texas theater, and I walk up to the theater, to the box office. I asked Ms. Post if she sold a ticket to a man who was wearing a brown shirt, and she said no, she hadn't. She was listening to the radio herself. And I said, a man walked in there, and I was going to go inside and ask the usher if he had seen him. I don't believe that Juliet Postal saw anybody, precisely because there wasn't anyone. The entire story about a man sneaking in the theater was made up by Brewer. Warren Commission Attorney Bellin wondered why Brewer would ask Postal if she sold a man a ticket when Brewer had just seen the man sneak into the theater without buying a ticket. Bellin, why did you ask Julia Postal whether she had or hadn't? Mr. Brewer, I don't know. Bellin, you just asked her? Eh, just asked her whether she had bought or she had seen him go in. Now, Brewer hurried into the theater and asked Dutch Burroughs if he had collected a ticket from a man who he thought had just entered the theater and was acting suspicious. At this point, we know that Harvey Oswald purchased a ticket and in the theater around 107, 108, and sat in the lower section. Lee Oswald probably entered the theater around 120, purchased a ticket, and took a seat in the balcony. Now, the one commission asked Mr. Burroughs what he would do if a person in the theater without purchasing a ticket. Mr. Ball, if anybody comes into the theater without a ticket, what do you do? Run them off? Burroughs, well, I make it a point to stop them, ask them to go out and get a ticket. I just failed to see him when he slipped in. I want to see what you usually do if someone comes in without a ticket. I stop them and have them go out to the box office and get an admission ticket. Now, if a person on the street or anyone sees someone entering a movie theater, apparently without buying a ticket, how likely is it that person would take any action at all? It's not like it was a violent crime, an assault, or a victim needed help. It's not your theater. It's not your business. Plus, there might be an extended circumstance such as he already bought a ticket, but had to do something else. Who knows? So at most, you might tell a theater employee that someone snuck into the theater. But would you take it on yourself to chase this person into the theater? I doubt it. So neither Butch Burroughs nor Julia Postal would have called the police. And if, even if they had seen a man sneak into the theater, it was Johnny Brewer who raised such a commotion that Julia finally called the police at 144. The readers must remember that Julia Post was not the only person that called the police about a suspicious man. JFK researcher Leo Savage asked Dallas District Attorney Jim Bowie whether the phone call by Postal had led to Oswald's arrest. Bowie told Savage there was a call from the cashier, but there were also half a dozen other calls to the police concerning a suspicious man. A half a dozen calls to the police by a person or persons unknown is a clear indication of a conspiracy. One of those calls may have come from Jack Ruby's friend, Tommy Rowe, who worked with Brewer and who may have prodded Brewer into thinking that the suspicious man who snuck into the theater killed Officer Ticket. Rose prodding of Brewer may account for some of the missing minutes. After half a dozen phone calls, the dispatcher finally reported that a suspicious man had gone into the theater. 26 police officers, mostly from 10th and Patton, quickly arrived at the theater. But it is very, very important for readers to understand that it was Captain Westbrook who was the first to arrive at the theater. 
Uh, Harvey Oswald is sitting with a brown shirt in the Texas Theater since 107. He's the guy that changed seats, looking apparently looking for someone. Lee Oswald wearing the white shirt is the one who shot Tippett. Once again, white shirt, brown shirt. You've got Harvey Oswald wearing a long sleeve brown shirt sitting in the lower section of the movie theater. You've got Lee Oswald wearing a white T-shirt who bought a ticket and went up to the balcony. At some point, Lee Oswald may have tried to leave the theater. He could have walked down the rear stairway and out the exit door that opened onto the alley. But behind the theater was a young man standing next to a pickup truck with the engine running. If Lee Oswald had left the building, Harvey Oswald would be sitting in the theater with a murder weapon. But Burroughs, able to see the west exit door at the bottom of the stairs from the concession stand, may have prevented his departure. We will soon learn that when Captain Westbrook arrived at the Tippett murder scene, he was carrying a wallet that contained identification for Lee Harvey Oswald and Alec Heidel. Neither Croy nor Westbrook discussed the wallet with the police, the FBI, uh, the Secret Service, or the Warren Commission. It was not until 1996 that Croy told researchers that he gave the wallet to Westbrook at Tipton Patton. But there is, and never has been, any existing evidence, any testimony, or any police FBI rights to support or verify Croy's claim. Croy should have been asked why he didn't give the wallet to any of the two dozen regular police officers and detectives who arrived at the scene. Croy should have been asked why he held on to the wallet a half an hour before giving it to Westbrook, who did not arrive until 1.40 at Kenton Patton. In my opinion, Croy never saw that wallet, never had it in his possession. When the police officers arrived at Kenton Patton, Harvey Oswald, wearing the brown shirt, is sitting in the lower section of the Texas theater. Lee Oswald, wearing a white T-shirt, is in the balcony, the upper section. Captain Westbrook, as we've discussed before, had a desk job at police headquarters where he was in charge of personnel. On November 22nd, Westbrook took it upon himself to participate in a homicide investigation at the book depository, yet there are no reports of his presence in the building. Of course, I believe that Westbrook was never in the book depository. I believe that Westbrook was one of the police officers looking for Harvey Oswald on McWater's bus around 1245. After searching the bus, the author believes that Westbrook and Croy drove three or four minute drive to Oak Cliff in an attempt to locate Harvey Oswald around 1250, 1251, 52. Now, I've said it before and I'll say it again. Were Westbrook and Croy, the two police officers seen by Erlene Roberts driving past 1026 North Beckley around one o'clock, one, a little after one o'clock. Now, Westbrook and Croy, if they, were, if they were at Beckley, it's a minute and a half drive to 10th and Patton. So Westbrook and Croy soon arrived at 410 East 10th for the pre-arranged meeting with Officer Tippett. They drove down the alley between 10th Street and Jefferson, and they turned in the small driveway between 404 and 410 East 10th. After witnessing the shooting of Officer Tippett, Sergeant Croy remained at 10th and Patton and was seen moments later by Virginia Davis. Captain Westbrook left the scene. I believe, this is speculation, I believe he met up with Lee Oswald. And then he drove his police vehicle back to the Texas School Book Depository, again, three or four minute drive, and arrived around 1.15. Westbrook told the Warren Commission that he walked from Dallas Police Headquarters to the Texas Book Depository. 25-minute walk. I don't believe he did. Croy said he was stuck in traffic, talked to police officers in front of the courthouse, then went to lunch with his estranged wife. I don't believe that. But what their stories do is gives them, both Croy and Westbrook, an alibi. An alibi so that they could both be on McWater's bus looking for Oswald, drive to... 1026 Beckley, and then drive to 10th and Patton around 105-ish, witness the shooting of Tippett, and Westbrook could easily have been back to the book depository in three or four minutes, well in time for the police dispatcher to broadcast a shooting in Oak Cliff. Then Captain Westbrook gets back in his car like nothing's happened and drives over to 10th and Patton. But I think the most important, the most credible statement was by Jim Ewell, a reporter for the Dallas Morning News. Jim Newell jumped in the back seat of a car driven by Captain Westbrook, along with Sergeant Stringer, who was assigned to Westbrook in the personnel department. 
Now, Westbrook drove his, um, with Jim Ewell, the reporter, in the car. Westbrook drove his unmarked car after hearing the police officer had been shot at Oakland. He drives it to Oakland. But very curiously, and this is, to me, so important, he didn't drive to the Tippett murder scene at 10th and Patton. Why? Westbrook drove his unmarked dark blue police car to a parking lot behind the Battle of Texaco station on East Jefferson, where the suspect's light-colored Eisenhower jacket was found just a few moments later. Now, in my opinion, Westbrook planted the jacket there because he'd received the jacket 10 minutes earlier from Lee Oswald. And he also received Oswald's wallet and the pistol that was used to shoot Tippett. Westbrook told the Warren Commission that while at the Texas Book Depository, he heard over his police radio. That's what he told the Warren Commission, his police radio. But remember, Westbrook just told the Warren Commission that he walked to the Book Depository. So my belief is that he drove his own car there, and he was telling the Warren Commission he heard over his police radio that an officer had been shot in Oakland. Westbrook, according to Jim Ewell, drove the car, his car, from the Book Depository to Oak Cliff. So Westbrook hears that an officer has been shot at Oak Cliff. Westbrook told the Warren Commission that he ran to my radio, my radio, again, my radio, because I am the personnel officer. And that then became, of course, my greatest interest at that time. And so Sergeant Stringer and I and some patrolman, I don't recall his name, then drove immediately to the immediate vicinity of where Officer Tippett had been shot and killed. Now, let me say it again. Westbrook told the Warren Commission he didn't have a car. He told the Warren Commission an officer drove him to the scene of the Tippett murder. Yet Westbrook also told the Warren Commission he heard about the shooting over his police radio, and he ran to my radio. Westbrook was lying when he said some patrolman drove him to Oak Cliff. Westbrook, according to Jim Ewell, who was riding in the back seat, drove his own dark blue unmarked police car to Oak Cliff. There wasn't an officer that let Westbrook out of the scene of Tippett's murder because Westbrook drove his car directly to a parking lot behind 401 East Jefferson, where moments later, the white Eisenhower jacket was found. Jim Ewell, reporter Jim Ewell, said the unmarked dark blue police car was driven by Captain Westbrook with Sergeant Stringer, Sergeant Owens, and himself riding in the back seat. The two officers, Stringer and Owens, were assigned to Westbrook in the personnel bureau. They arrived at 401 East Jefferson, the Battle of Texaco parking lot, behind the Battle of Texaco station, about 125. Now, this is only a block and a half south of 10th and Patton. It's very close to where Tippett was shot, but it's not where Tippett's body was. It's not where the evidence picked him, but it's a block and a half away. It's important for readers to remember that Westbrook told the Warren Commission, I'm the personnel officer. We conduct all background investigations of applicants, both civilian and police, and then we make, we investigate all personnel complaints, not all of them, but the major ones. Now, why does a personnel officer who works at a desk in an office at the police station wearing plain clothes involve himself in a homicide investigation? Westbrook told the Warren Commission, I'm the personnel officer, and that then became Tippett's murder, of course, my greatest interest at the time. But Westbrook's actions and his whereabouts show that he had very little interest in Officer Tippett. Westbrook did not drive to the scene of the Tippett shooting at Tippett and Patton. He did not drive to the hospital where Tippett was taken by ambulance. He did not visit Tippett's wife later in the day. Westbrook's priority was to drive to the parking lot behind the Battle of Texaco station, where moments later, moments after he arrived, the suspect's Eisenhower type jacket was found. Now, Sergeant Owens, got out of Westbrook's car and began talking with an attendant at the Texaco station. Jim Ewell got out of Westbrook's car and hurried to McCandle's Minute Market, where he made a telephone call to the city desk at the Dallas Morning News and told his employer he was in Oak Cliff. As Ewell left the Minute Market, he saw Assistant DA William Alexander, quote, with an automatic pistol, stalking across the balcony of a two-story boarding house that police were searching. Sergeant Stringer probably got out of the car and joined fellow officers in shaking down the adjacent buildings looking for the suspect. That left Captain Westbrook alone in his police car. And in my opinion, he drove past a 1954 Oldsmobile and either threw the Eisenhower-type jacket underneath the back end of this car, or he already knew the jacket was there. If Westbrook was not somehow involved with the jacket, then why did he drive directly from the Texas School Book Depository to this parking lot. 
and ignore the Tippett murder scene altogether. Now, motorcycle officer John R. Mackey was in the parking lot. Mackey said, quote, about the time we reached the area, the dispatcher was broadcasting information regarding the suspect and his escape route. We pulled up on Jefferson and started checking some cars parked behind a service station to see if the suspect was hiding in or under one of those cars. That's when we found his jacket. We saw Captain Westbrook in his car on Jefferson, so I turned the jacket over to him. Mackey said he turned the jacket over to Captain Westbrook. When questioned by the Warren Commission, Personnel Officer Westbrook said he could not remember the name of the officer who found the jacket. Westbrook told the Warren Commission, I walked on towards the parking lot behind the Texaco service station, and some officer said, look, there's a jacket underneath the car. So I walked over and reached under and picked up the jacket. Westbrook said he picked up the jacket. Now, while Westbrook's and Mackey's story may differ, both men were seen by Officer Thomas Hudson, who was about 25 yards away. Officer Hudson told the Warren Commission he saw a fellow officer pick up the jacket. Now, in 1978, years later, researcher Larry Ray Harris interviewed John Mackey, who refused to discuss the jacket. Mackey told Harris, look, that information might be something they, senior Dallas police officers, don't want to give it out. I doubt that senior officers, police officers, would care whether it was Mackey Westbrook who found the jacket. However, the senior Dallas police officers would not want any information given out that suggested Captain Westbrook was somehow connected to the jacket. Let's go to the Warren Commission testimony. Mr. Bellin, prior to that time, had there been any recovery of any items of clothing? Mr. Hudson. Yes. When did that occur? Mr. Hudson. That occurred when we were searching the rear of the house in the Florida block of East Jefferson Boulevard at the rear of the Texaco station. Now, readers should remember that news reporter Jim Ewell saw police searching the houses near the Texaco station when he, uh, riding in the backseat of Westbrook's car, arrived about 1, 20, 2, 3, 4, 5, something in there. Behind cars parked at this location was a white jacket picked up by another officer. I observed him as he picked it up, and it was stated this was probably the suspect's jacket. Hudson said that Captain Westbrook was in the parking lot around 124, 125, when Officer John Mackey picked up the jacket. Now, if you put all this together, it looks to me like what could have happened is what Westbrook, in the car by himself, after his two police officers and uh, Jim Ewell got out of the car, put that jacket underneath the Oldsmobile. Then it was spotted by um, Mackey. Mackey picked it up, and there is a video. It's very short, maybe five, six, seven seconds long of an officer holding that jacket. And I think this is the same run around and photographed officers holding Oswald's wallet. Anyway, at 125, only one minute after finding the jacket, the Dallas Police Dispatcher received information of Unit 279 that the suspect had dumped the jacket on this parking lot behind this service station at 400 Block East Jefferson across from Dudley Hughes, and he had a white jacket on. We believe this is it. But why would a motorcycle patrolman, Mackey, radio in such information when Captain Westbrook was with him? The police dispatch log showed Unit 279 reported finding the jacket, but the log does not identify the officer by name. This unit number was used by two other officers, J.T. Griffin and Mackey. I believe that the officer who identified himself as 279 was not Mackey, but was Captain Westbrook, who used Mackey's unit number when he called the dispatcher. Interested readers should listen to the DPD dispatch recording of number 279. The voice is that of a middle-aged man, not a young man. I think it was Westbrook. And the reason he would have made that is you look back at the transmission, and he said he had a white jacket on. We believe this is it. Now, this is very, very interesting. Remember, I said all along that Westbrook did not go to 10th and Patton. He drove directly to the parking lot behind the Texaco station. He um, even know he ditched it. I mean, what inclination would anybody think that the guy took off his jacket? That, that's the whole point. Westbrook, in my opinion, was given that jacket by Lee Oswald after he shot Tippett. I believe Westbrook knew exactly what was going on, and he was trying to fill in the blanks to link the jacket to the shooter. 
Mackey supposedly found the jacket along with Westbrook, but why did neither one initial the jacket or write a police report about finding the jacket? Why was Mackey never interviewed by the FBI, the Secret Service, Warren Commissioner HSCA, and asked about finding and identifying the suspect's jacket? I believe it's because Westbrook was trying to hide his involvement in any connection with this jacket. Nothing concerning this jacket, allegedly thrown down by the man who shot and killed Tippett, was discussed or mentioned in the police logs for the next 20 minutes. Why? When questioned by the Warren Commission about the jacket, Westbrook said, actually, I didn't find it. It was pointed out to me by some other officer that while we were going, through, going over the scene in the close area where the shooting was concerned, someone pointed out a jacket to me that was laying under a car, and I got the jacket. Now, there's Westbrook saying he got the jacket, and I got the jacket and told the officer to take the license plate number. Westbrook failed to identify the officer who discovered the jacket because, in my opinion, it was Westbrook who planted the jacket in the parking lot. Westbrook then said he turned the jacket over to one of the officers, yet he could not remember the name of the officer who had this very important piece of evidence if it belonged to the shooter. Captain Westbrook, in charge of personnel, could not remember the name of the officer who picked up the jacket, gave him the jacket, or the name of the officer to whom he gave the jacket. Westbrook's line. Westbrook's testimony. You were just looking around to see what you could see? Westbrook, yes. And at this time, I had a shotgun. I bought a shotgun from a patrolman. Where did you go when you got out of the car? I walked through, and this is a car lot. There are a parking area right along in there, and I don't know whether I am wrong on the location or not, but I think I'm right. You walked through a car lot, did you? Yes, sir. And I think I came out. Is that a church? There's a church right there close by. Was there a station anywhere near there, a service station? Oh, there could have been. Yes, sir. But there was either a used car lot or a parking lot. That I don't know. On what street? It was actually on Jefferson, but the place where the jacket was found would have been back closer to the alley, Mr. Ball. Behind the Texaco service station? Yeah, behind the Texaco service station. And some officer, I feel sure it was an officer, I can't be positive, pointed out this jacket to me, and it was lying slightly underneath one, the rear of one of the cars. What was the name of the officer? I couldn't tell you that, sir. No, I did. When I left the scene, I turned the jacket over to one of the officers, and I went by that church, I think, and I think that would be on 10th Street. I will show you Commission Exhibit 162. Do you recognize that? That is exactly the jacket we found. That's the jacket you found? Yes, sir. And you turn it over to whom? Westbrook. Now, it was to this officer, that not the name. Does your report show the name of the officer? No, sir, it doesn't. When things like this happen, it's happening so fast, you don't remember those things. Eight minutes after receiving information relating to the suspect's jacket, the police dispatcher was still using the original description of the suspect. White jacket, white shirt, dark slacks. Why? At this point, the description of the suspect should have been white shirt, dark slacks. 1.33 p.m., Sergeant Owens. We're shaking down these old houses out here in the border block of East Jefferson right now. 1.34, Officer McDonald requests more Police squads to search, search the abundant life temple. 134, Captain Westbrook asks the dispatcher, what officer have you got commanding this area over here where this officer was shot? Now, this is important because Westbrook is still not been to 10th and Patton. He's still behind the parking lot behind the Texaco station. 134, Captain Westbrook reported, quote, we got a witness that's seen him go north after shed his jacket. Really? Westbrook was lying. Westbrook never had a witness. But he needed a witness to say that the jacket belonged to the man who matched the description of the suspect. Without a witness, there was no way to connect the jacket to the man who shot Tippett. Westbrook was the only officer who said there was a witness that saw the suspect shed his jacket. But no such witness was ever identified or located. I think this is just more lies from Captain Westbrook in order to link the jacket to the suspect who shot Tippett. 135, the police dispatcher was still using the original description, wearing a light gray Eisenhower-type jacket, dark trousers, and a white shirt. 136, Officer C.T. Walker reported the man fitting the description of the Tippett suspect ran into the Jefferson Branch Library. 
Captain Westbrook drove a few blocks in his vehicle, drove a few blocks to the library. At 1.38, Sergeant Owens told the police dispatcher that the library was the wrong man. Captain Westbrook then finally drove to the Tippett murder scene for the first time, but for a very, very short time. The police dispatch at 1.38 said the man at the library was the wrong man. So Westbrook then drives his car a minute, maybe, to 10th and Patton. So he arrives around 139, 140, something like that. That's the first time he arrives. Now, Westbrook arrives at 10th and Patton around 140. Julia Postal calls 144. The police leave the Tippett shooting scene for the Texas Book Depository sometime around 145, close to 145. That means Westbrook was only at 10th and Patton for four to five minutes. And during that time, he pulls out a wallet that belongs to Lee Harvey Oswald and shows it to fellow officers and shows it to FBI agent Robert Barrett. I believe that Westbrook got that wallet from Lee Oswald after Lee Oswald shot him. Captain Westbrook left the parking lot and drove a few blocks west of the library in response to report that a suspicious man was seen in the day. After Sergeant Owens reported it was the wrong man, Westbrook drove to the Tippett murder scene. Now, this is kind of important. If Westbrook was the man seen by Mrs. Holen inspecting Tippett's body after he was shot and killed, then Westbrook's return to Tenth and Patton had to be very brief. He had to be careful. Witnesses may have remembered his presence at Tenth and Patton when Tippett was murdered. That could cause big, big problems. Westbrook's reason for driving to Tenth and Patton was to show fellow officers that the wallet given to him a half an hour earlier by Lee Oswald was the identity of the man who shot Tippett. Identification in this wallet would identify Lee Harvey Oswald as the prime suspect. Identification for Alex Heidel in the wallet would show the link Oswald Heidel to the rifle found on the sixth floor of the book depository. There were now many police and dozens of onlookers lookers with whom Westbrook could mingle. Hopefully, nobody would recognize him as the man who was with Lee Oswald when Tippett was shot and killed. This was the man seen by Akila Clements. Westbrook goes off in one direction. The shooter goes off in a different direction. Two men at the scene of the Tippett murder reported by, I believe, four or five witnesses. Now, Captain Westbrook arrives at 10th and Patton around 140 and ordered officers to search the area west of the shooting in the direction of the Texas Theater. He then began showing fellow officers the second Oswald wallet. A few minutes later, 142, crime lab officers George Doherty, Barnes, and Paul Bentley arrived and inspected the wallet produced by Westbrook. FBI agent Bob Barrett arrived, parked his car, and walked towards Tippett's patrol car. Barrett explained, I went on over there, and Captain Westbrook was there with several of his officers. It hadn't been very long when Westbrook looked up and saw me and called me over. He had this wallet in his hand. Now, I don't know where he found it, but he had the wallet in his hand. The wallet was there. There's no getting around that. Westbrook had the wallet in his hand and asked me if I knew who these people were. I'm adamant. There was a wallet in somebody's hand, and Westbrook asked me if I knew who Lee Harvey Oswald was and who Idell were. As Westbrook showed the wallet to Barrett and fellow DPD officers, news photographer Ron Ryland filmed the event. Sergeant Bud Owens is holding the wallet, and Captain Doherty is looking at the wallet. Westbrook's possession of the wallet shows that he knew Lee Oswald and knew about the pre planned assassination of Tippett. Four to five minutes, after arriving at 10th and Patton, Captain Westbrook reclaimed the wallet and returned to the parking lot behind the Texaco station. That's important. Remember, Westbrook told the Warren Commission that Tippett was his priority. He was one of his officers. Yet he only spends four to five minutes at the Tippett murder scene. His focus of attention is on that parking lot behind the Texaco station where the suspect's jacket was allegedly found. Now, Identification from the wallet guaranteed that Harvey Oswald, Lee Harvey Oswald, was the prime suspect in the murder of Officer Tippett and President Kenny. If Harvey Oswald had not been found in the Texas theater, a nationwide manhunt would have begun for the former defector, the communist supporter of Castro, the man, I know, who ordered a 6.5 manager of Carcano from Kleins, the man who ordered a 38 revolver from Seaport Traders, the man who left the Texas Book Depository after President Kennedy was shot, 
And then his identification was found in a wallet at the Tippett murder scene. The wallet produced by Westbrook is the best single piece of evidence that proves both conspiracy and the framing of Harvey Oswald for the murder of Tippett and the murder of President Kennedy. This wallet was never initialed by Dallas police officers, never entered into evidence, never turned over to the Identification or Homicide Bureau, never mentioned in a single police report or a single FBI report, nor was it discussed at all with the Warren Commission. This wallet, shown to officers for only a few minutes and filmed by Ron Ryland, was last seen in Westbrook's hands and then disappeared forever. Both Westbrook and Crow were interviewed with the Warren Commission but neither man discussed the wallet with the FBI Warren Commission or anyone at any time. 33 years later, in 1996, Croy, for the first time, told researchers that, quote, an unknown witness gave him the wallet, which he then gave to Westbrook. It should not surprise anyone to learn that there is no existing evidence to support or verify his claim. Not one witness, not one ambulance driver, not one neighbor, not one bystander, nor anyone saw a wallet on the street in Tippett's car or anywhere. Ted Calloway arrived before Tippett's body was loaded into an ambulance. Calloway said, I'll tell you one thing. There was no billfold at that scene. If there was, there would have been too many people who would have seen it. Because of their actions and involvement at Tenth and Patton, I firmly believe that Westbrook Croy and Lee Oswald conspired to murder Officer Tippett and to frame Harvey Oswald for the crime. Now, After spending four or five minutes at Tenth and Patton, Captain Westbrook drives his car a block and a half to the Texaco parking lot. Westbrook was only at the tip of murder scene for a few minutes, but it was long enough for him to show Lee Oswald's wallet to fellow police officers. After showing the wallet, after identifying the suspect as Oswald, Westbrook reclaimed the wallet, returned to the parking lot behind the Texaco station. In my opinion, while at Tenth and Patton, Westbrook told crime lab officers George Doherty and Barnes about the jacket in the parking lot. They then accompanied or followed Westbrook to the parking lot where they photographed a 1954 Oldsmobile under which the jacket was found. His photographer Ron Ryland may also have accompanied Westbrook to the parking lot where a brief film clip was made of a Dallas police officer holding in his hand the Eisenhower jacket. At 1.44, someone called the police dispatcher and said, the jacket the suspect was wearing over here on Jefferson bears a laundry tag with the letter B9738. See if there's any way you can check this laundry tag. The police logs identify the caller as Sergeant Stringer from the Personnel Bureau, where Westbrook is. However, when interviewed in 1978 by the researcher Larry Harris, Stringer said, I never did see the jacket, and I didn't radio in on it. Once again, it appears that Captain Westbrook, using Sergeant Stringer's call sign, radioed the police dispatcher and provided information about the laundry tag on the jacket. Reporter Jim Ewell said, I was with Westbrook as we all went over to examine the jacket because it was the only tangible thing we had at the moment that belonged to the killer. In fact, I held the jacket in my hands. At 1.44, same time, the police dispatcher reports we have information a suspect just went to the Texas Theater on West Jefferson, supposedly hiding in the balcony. Jim Ewell recalled they were discussing it, the jacket, when the report came in that a suspect had gone into the Texas Theater. Now remember, this is 144. I believe that Harvey was in that theater wearing the dark brown shirt about 105, 106, 107. That's according to Butch Burroughs. And I believe that Lee Oswald bought a ticket from Postal wearing the white T-shirt and ran up to the balcony. That's why when the police got there, most of the police were told the suspect is in the balcony. He was in the balcony. But the man arrested was one in the lower section wearing a dark brown shirt. Jim Ewell said, immediately, Captain Westbrook and Sergeant Stringer ran back to the car, which was across the street, and I ran to jump in the back seat. By that time, they were already turning out and accelerating. When I got in the back seat with the door still hanging open, I came out of the car hanging onto the door. They slowed down long enough for me to get back in. Captain Westbrook, however, said nothing about running to his car and driving his car to the theater. Remember? Westbrook had told the Warren Commission that an officer drove him to Tenth and Patton. He didn't know the officer's name, and he didn't know where the officer went after he left Westbrook out. Lies. 
told the Warren Commission, Westbrook, when I left the scene, I turned this jacket over to one of the officers, and I went by that church, and I think it would be a 10th Street. But Captain Westbrook was lying. He didn't give the jacket to one of his officers. Westbrook held on to the jacket. He had crime lab personnel initial the jacket for evidence. Barnes and Doherty's initials are on the jacket. Westbrook then took the jacket to police headquarters, arriving about 2.10 p.m., and Westbrook himself wrote a police report about the jacket and placed the jacket into evidence at 3 p.m. Westbrook had the jacket, I believe, put under, underneath the car at the Oldsmobile at the Expo Station. I believe he had the jacket in his possession, took it back to the police station in his car. I don't believe the jacket was ever given to an officer. Of course, that's why Westbrook would remember the name of the officer, because there was no officer to whom he gave it to. Less than 10 minutes after Tippett was shot and killed, Westbrook had possession of three very important items of evidence that belonged to the suspect, Lee Oswald's jacket, Lee Oswald's wallet. This author believes the suspect gave these items to Captain Westbrook, who was present when Lee Oswald shot Tippett at Tenth and Pat, prior to arriving at the Texas Theater. We all know that Westbrook did everything he could to distance himself from the jacket. We know the wallet produced by Westbrook and shown to officers at Tenth and Patton disappeared. I believe that Lee Oswald also gave the 38 revolver that he used to murder Tippett to Westbrook. Remember, Lee Oswald could not take any of these items into the Texas theater, fearing that if he was still there when the police arrived, he'd be searched. A half an hour after Haas, Harvey Oswald's arrest at the Texas theater, these three items of evidence, the wallet, the jacket, the 38 revolver, were in Captain Westbrook's office at police headquarters. Jim Ewell said that when they arrived at the Texas Theater, Captain Westbrook parked his unmarked dark blue police car directly in front of the theater. Now, look at another photo by good old Stuart Reed, the guy who worked for the U.S. Army in photographic waters bus. Look at the photograph. That unmarked police car directly under the marquee at the theater, Texas Theater. Do you know what that tells us? That tells us that Westbrook was the first one to arrive at the Texas Theater. Minutes later, there were a dozen cars police cars around the Texas theater. But here's Westbrook's car right in front of the Texas theater. After they arrived at the Texas theater, Jim Ewell said everybody jumped out and went into the lobby. Ewell was very clear that it was Westbrook who drove the police car. But Captain Westbrook told the Warren Commission a very different story. Westbrook said Sergeant Stringer, I, and FBI agent Barrett got into another squad car, and I don't know what officer was driving this one, but then we arrived and we were approaching the theater. I had directed the patrolman to turn down the alley instead of going around to the front because I figured there would be a lot of cars at the front. There were two or three cars at the back. So I and Barrett Stringer went to another door and I and Barrett, we stopped at the first one. We got out and walked to this first entrance that was nearest us. And as we walked into the door, I met an employee of the theater. Again, Captain Westbrook is totally lying. FBI agent Bob Barrett did not ride to the theater with Westbrook. In a 1977 interview for the House Select Committee, Westbrook said that Barrett drove his own vehicle to the theater. Barrett, in a 1996 interview, confirmed that he drove himself to the theater in his own car. Westbrook lied. Westbrook drove his own dark blue unmarked police car to the theater. Westbrook parked his car directly in front of the theater, yet told the Warren Commission he directed the patrolman to turn down the alley. Nearly everything Westbrook said concerning the jacket and his involvement with the Tippett shooting was a lie. He had to lie in order to conceal his involvement with the Tippett murder. Now, we're going to go inside the Texas theater. The conventional story is that it was Johnny Ruhr who saw Oswald wearing a dark brown shirt in the vestibule of his shoe store, saw him run past Julia Postal, sneak into the theater a few minutes after 1.30. There are Many witnesses inside the Texas theater, Butch Burroughs, Jack Davis, said Oswald was in that theater at 107, 110. So what's Brewer doing? Why is he saying there was a man in a brown shirt at 135-ish who he followed into the Texas theater? Why is he saying that? And what about Lee Oswald? Could it have been Lee Oswald? Well, yeah, it could have been. But Lee Oswald had a white T-shirt on, not a long sleeve, dark brown shirt. And Lee Oswald, in my opinion, bought a ticket from Julia Postal. So, we've got Brewer lying. Why? Harvey Oswald, wearing a dark brown shirt, had been in the theater since 107, 108. He sat next to Jack Davis, changed seats a few times, purchased popcorn from Butch Bros at 115, and then was seen sitting next to a pregnant woman. 
The only Oswald that Brewer could have seen at 135, if he saw anyone, would have been Lee Oswald wearing a short sleeve white shirt. But who does Brewer identify to the police in the theater? The man wearing a dark brown shirt, Harvey Oswald? I don't know if Johnny Brewer was a minor co-conspirator or just a wannabe, but I do know that when Brewer described the man he claimed to have seen in his store to Julia Postal and to the Warren Commission, his description was very different than the suspect described by the police dispatcher wearing a white shirt and dark pants. Because of Brewer, the police were called to the theater and arrested Harvey Oswald, the man wearing the long sleeve brown shirt. Brewer lied about hearing Oswald's description on the radio broadcast. If he had have heard the description, what would he have heard? White shirt, dark pants. So where in the world has Brewer come up with telling a story that he saw this man wearing a dark brown long sleeve shirt looking suspicious in the vestibule of his shoe store? Brewer's lying. Why? Now, he lied about Oswald acting suspicious and being scared in front of his store. He lied to Julia Postal. He lied to Butch Burroughs. He lied to the police when he identified the man wearing the dark brown shirt, suspicious man who snuck into the theater. He lied to the Warren Commission. Brewer had to lie because Brewer never saw anyone in front of his store. There are clear indications that Brewer may have given the description of the man arrested in the theater by a co-worker in his store. That co-worker was Tommy Rowe, a close friend of Jack Ruby's. Tommy Rowe was a very close friend of Jack Ruby's and he worked at Hardy's shoe store with Johnny Brewer. In 1964, Rowe told researcher Penn Jones that it was he who told store manager Johnny Brewer that he saw a man wearing a brown shirt enter the Texas theater. Inside the darkened theater, Rowe claims it was he, not Brewer, who directed the police to the man wearing the long sleeve brown shirt, Harvey Oswald. Rowe was never interviewed by the Dallas police or the FBI. For years after the assassination, Rowe told friends, relatives, and JFK researchers that it was he, not Brewer, who pointed out Oswald to the police inside the dark of the Texas theater. Roe was so close to Jack Ruby that he moved into Ruby's apartment when Ruby went to jail for killing Oswald. In 1967, the New Orleans District Attorney's Office interviewed Tommy Roe, who lived in the apartment 206 at 223 South Jefferson. This was the apartment next to the one occupied by Jack Ruby in 1963. If Roe's statement is true, then Johnny Brewer lied to Julia Posto, lied to the police, lied to the FBI, and lied to the Warren Commission. He never followed the man in the brown shirt or anyone to the Texas theater. The man responsible for getting the police to the Texas theater appears to have been Jack Ruby's friend, Tommy Rowe, and it appears that Johnny Brewer may have merely been a wannabe and not a co-conspirator. If Rowe's story is true, then we have to wonder how Rowe knew about a man wearing a dark brown long sleeve shirt in the Texas theater. Rowe's close relationship with Jack Ruby may be the answer. Lee Oswald, wearing the white T-shirt, probably arrived at the theater eight to nine minutes after shooting ticket, around 1.20. When the police arrived, they already knew the name of their suspect from the identification in the wallet produced by Westbrook. And Westbrook probably knew that Harvey Oswald was in possession of a loaded 38 revolver. If Harvey displayed the revolver or pointed it at the police, he would be shot and killed. You've got to understand that Brewer could not have seen anyone at 130, 135. Both Oswalds were already in the Texas theater. So somebody has to prod Brewer. Somebody has to tell Brewer that a man with a long sleeved brown shirt stuck into the Texas theater. Brewer didn't see anything. But I think Jack Ruby was heavily involved in this. I think Jack Ruby and Oswald together in the summer of 63, seen by lots of witnesses, is very, very important because that's when Harvey and Marina were in New Orleans. I believe that it was Lee Oswald who set up Harvey for the assassination. I believe it was Lee Oswald who went to these various places, the Sports Dome Rifle Range or the, the downtown Lincoln Mercury, the Statler Hilton Hotel, applying for a job. You know, I think it was Lee Oswald setting up Harvey. And I think the instructions came from Ruby, and Ruby's instructions likely came from David Atley Phillips. And their joint contact was Gordon McClendon, who owned the KLIF radio station. Jack Ruby knew Gordon McClendon very well. And David Atley Phillips was friends with Gordon McClendon in high school in Fort Worth. Incidentally, after Oswald was put in jail and Jack Ruby was stalking the police station, he told people at his carousel club they could reach him by contacting KLIF radio. All these little connections seem to make sense if you put them all together. Anyway... 
The police arrive at the Texas Theater. The plan may have been to kill Harvey Oswald inside the dark theater, if and when Oswald pointed his 38 revolver at the police. But one thing the conspirators could not control was the number of potential witnesses, both civilian and police. Too many witnesses would make killing Harvey Oswald inside the theater difficult, if not impossible. Captain Westbrook parked his unmarked dark blue police car directly in front of the theater. Jim Yule said, I went up these stairs to the balcony. I stepped to the railing where I could look down on this. Then I saw the fight that broke out. Someone was trying to hold the barrel of a shotgun or train the barrel of a shotgun down among the heads of these officers. I don't know what was going on, but this person was holding a shotgun. I did see that. Now, who admitted to having a shotgun that day? Captain Westbrook. Now, the police in the balcony. The police dispatcher reported that the suspect was wearing dark trousers and a white T-shirt. Quote, have information a suspect just went into the Texas Theater on West Jefferson, supposed to be hiding in the balcony. Deputy Sheriff Bill Corson entered the front of the theater, hurried up the stairs to the balcony, and was, quote, reasonably satisfied in his own mind, end quote, that he met Lee Harvey Oswald coming down the front stairs. If this young man was Lee Oswald, and he was wearing a white T-shirt and dark trousers. Lieutenant Cunningham and Detective J.B. Tony encountered the young man and began to question him, perhaps because he matched the description of the suspect. As Deputy Sheriff Buddy Walters rushed up the stairs to the balcony, he saw the officers as they were questioning this young man. Now, when the police arrived in the alley behind the theater, Captain Talbert noticed a young man standing beside a pickup truck with the engine running. Officers questioned the young man searched the pickup, but made no police reports about the incident. Talbert testified before the Warren Commission, but at no time, in over 20 pages of testimony, was he asked, nor did he volunteer anything about the Texas Theater, Oswald's arrest, or the young man in the alley. We'll probably never know the name of this young man, nor will we know what he was doing in the alley while Lee Oswald was hiding in the balcony. Now, Westbrook parked his unmarked blue police car directly in front of the theater. Jim Yule said, I went up the stairs to the balcony. I stepped on the railing where I could look down. Then I saw the fight. As the police were scuffling with Harvey Oswald, Officer McDonald grabbed the revolver from Oswald's hand and passed it to Officer Bob Carroll. After Oswald was handcuffed, Captain Westbrook ordered his officers, cover his face, get him out of here. Cover his face because Westbrook knew that Lee Oswald was also in the theater. The two young men, Harvey and Lee, looked very much alike, and it would be difficult to explain why both were in the Texas theater at the same time. As Harvey Oswald was taken off the front of the Texas theater, a Dallas police officer told Julia Postal, we have our man on both counts. Julia said this was the first time she heard a tip of death, and the officers arresting Oswald had identified him by calling his name Oswald. Now, that's important. Because at that time, when they were taking Oswald out of the theater, his wallet was still in his back pocket. They didn't look at his wallet and identification until after they placed him in the police car. But thanks to Captain Westbrook, the Dallas police officers participating in Oswald's arrest already knew the man's name. As I previously mentioned, Jones Harris, a longtime assassination investigator, arrived in Dallas the day after the assassination. He interviewed Julia Postal in the office of the manager of the theater. Harris asked her, when she saw Harvey Oswald being let out of the theater if she had sold him a ticket. Postal burst into tears. Harris walked into the office and returned a short time later. When Harris asked again if she sold Harvey Oswald, Oswald Harvey, a ticket, she again burst into tears. Butch Burroughs, interviewed by the Texas researcher Jim Bars, said that Julia Postal knows she sold Harvey Oswald a ticket. I say Harvey Oswald. I should be saying Lee Harvey Oswald, but I'm trying to differentiate them between the fellow that was arrested, which is Harvey, and Lee, who was still in the balcony. Burroughs collected movie tickets when patrons entered the theaters. When Burroughs sold Harvey Oswald popcorn a few minutes after he entered the theater, he must have recognized Oswald as a paying customer. Otherwise, Burroughs would have asked him if he bought a ticket. Harvey Oswald was brought out the front ends of the Texas theater and placed into Captain Westbrook's dark blue unmarked police car. Isn't that interesting? Stuart Reed, the 30-year Army veteran who took a photo of McWater's bus on Elm, another photo of Oswald's uh, McWater's bus near the book depository, a photo of the sixth-floor window, was now taking photos of Harvey Oswald's arrest. Again, Stuart Reed took all of these photos, which sequentially followed Oswald's movements, 
from about 12.40 with McWhorter's bus through 1.50, Oswald's arrest. Reed should have been asked why he took photos of the front and back of McWhorter's bus, how he knew to take a photo of the sixth floor window long before it was identified as the sniper's nest, and how he managed to get to the Texas theater where Oswald was arrested. How did Reed know where and when to take all these photos? Reed dropped off his film at a photo lab in Dallas and then hurried to New Orleans. The FBI told the Warren Commission that a government executive answering to the military took the photos. This seemed to satisfy the Warren Commission, and Reed dropped out of sight without ever seeing his photos. Jim Ewell watched as the police brought Harvey out the front of the Texas theater. Ewell said, the next thing I recall is I was out on the street with the car that I arrived in, Captain Westbrook's car. Between me and the officers bringing Oswald out of the theater as they kind of separated the crowd and made an aisle for him to come through to get to the car. I said that was about 10 to 12 feet from Oswald at the time. Ewell said, Oswald then took my place in the back seat of the same car that I arrived in, the car driven by Westbrook. Officer Bob Carroll carried Harvey Oswald's revolver to the police car and handed it to Sergeant Hill, who also worked for Westbrook. Officer Carroll drove with Officer Lyon sitting in the right and Officer Jerry Hill in the middle of the front seat. Harvey Oswald was in the back seat with Paul Bentley on his right seat to walk on the left. Westbrook, when interviewed with the Warren Commission, said nothing about Oswald being driven to police headquarters in his unmarked police car. From the police dispatch at 144, it had taken the police less than eight minutes to drive from Tenton Patton to the Texas Theater, arrest Harvey Oswald, place him in the police car, and begin driving to the police station. Only eight minutes. Why don't you see if he's got any identification? Paul was sitting sort of sideways in the seat, and with his right hand, he reached down and felt the suspect's left hip pocket and said, yes, he has a billfold, and he took it out. And Lee Oswald was called out by Bentley from the back seat and said this identification, I believe, was on a library card. And he also made the statement that there was more identification in this other name, which I don't remember, but it was the same name that later came up in the paper that he had bought the gun under. Now, Bentley told us, I removed his wallet from his back pocket and obtained his identification. Sergeant Hill said the only way we found out what his name was was to remove his wallet and check it ourselves. He wouldn't even tell us his name. Bentley and Hill had possession of Harvey Oswald's wallet, while Captain Westbrook had possession of a second Oswald wallet. These two wallets could have created serious problems and alerted the public to the possibility of truly Harvey Oswald's if properly identified as evidence and reported. Harvey Oswald's wallet and contents were turned in at police headquarters where all items were inventoried and photographed, but the wallet that appeared in the hands of Captain Westbrook at 10th and Patton was unexplainable. This second wallet could never, ever be made public and quickly disappeared, last seen in the hands of Captain Westbrook. It is worth remembering that Harvey Oswald never gave the police his name or address while riding in the squad car to police headquarters. As a side note, there were a total of five Oswald wallets, a black plastic wallet, a red billfold found at Ruth Paints, a brown billfold found at Ruth Paints, a billfold taken from Oswald's arrest, and the Westbrook wallet, which was not initialed by police, not listed in inventory, not photographed, not mentioned by a single witness, and it disappeared. But not before it was filmed by Ron Ryland of WFAA TV and seen by police officers and FBI agent Bob Barrett. Before leaving the Texas theater, Captain Westbrook ordered Detective Taylor Cunningham and J.B. Tony take the names and dresses of the occupants of the theater. Detective Taylor noted in his report that he, Cunningham, Tony, remained at the theater following the arrest and took the names and addresses of the occupants of the theater. These officers would likely have turned their completed lists over to the man who gave them their order, Captain Westbrook. But these lists of theater patrons like the wallet produced by Westbrook at 10th and Patton, disappeared and were never seen again. There was no evidence, chain of evidence, regarding the list of theater patrons or the wallet. No police reports, and both items simply disappeared. The Warren Commission, perhaps intentionally, did not take the testimony of Taylor Cunningham or Tony. They could have asked any of these officers what they did with their completed lists of theater patrons. The Warren Commission did ask Westbrook 
about the list of theater patrons, and, as can be expected, he answered, quote, no, possibly Lieutenant Cunningham will know, but I don't know who has the list. The Warren Commission asked Westbrook what he did after Oswald was arrested. Westbrook told the Warren Commission he went back to City Hall and resumed his desk. Did you see him taken from the theater? No, I went the other way. You went to the back? Yes. Interesting. Westbrook went out the back. We'll get to that in a minute. Yes, he went out the front, and I never saw Oswald again. That's the last time I saw him. Westbrook may not have seen Harvey Oswald again after he was arrested, but Westbrook most likely saw Lee Oswald and may have been one of the officers that escorted Lee Oswald out the back of the Texas theater. Deputy Sheriff Bill Corson saw a young man in the balcony who looked identical to Oswald. One police report of Tippett's murder reads, quote, suspect was arrested in the balcony of the Texas theater. At least two other police documents reported the arrest occurring in the balcony. In his report to Captain Gataway, Dallas Police Detective L.D. Stringfellow wrote, quote, on November 22, 1963, Lee Harvey Oswald was arrested in the balcony of the Texas Theater and was charged with the murder of President Kennedy and the murder of Tim. How could several experienced career police officers and detectives report that Oswald was arrested in the balcony? When after a scuffle that involved many police, he was arrested in the lower section. How could they do this? Now, something happened in that second floor balcony. I speculate that Lee Oswald may have been momentarily arrested or detained in the balcony of the theater. Deputy Sheriff Bill Corson hurried up the stairs to the balcony and was reasonably satisfied in his own mind that he met Lee Harvey Oswald coming down the front stairs. Lieutenant Cunningham and Tony encountered a young man and began to question him. Deputy Sheriff Buddy Walters was rushing up the stairs to the balcony, and he saw these officers as they were questioning this young man. Okay. Sergeant Jerry Hill and Bet Detective Bentley were checking the fire escapes in the balcony when Sergeant Hill opened the exit door to the fire escape. Sergeant Stringer, standing in the alley below, heard someone inside the theater yell, We got him! The police officer inside the theater may have thought the man on the staircase, being questioned by Cunningham and Tony, was under arrest, which caused him to shout, We got him! This young man may have been wearing a white t-shirt and dark pants, which matched the description of the suspect who was reported by the police dispatch. But an unknown person who identified himself to the police as the manager on duty at the theater said the young man had been there since 12.05. Excuse me, the theater was not even open at 12.05. The unidentified manager on duty may have been an accomplice who provided Oswald with a much-needed alibi because the theater manager, Johnny Callahan, left the theater before the police arrived, and Julia Postal, Butch Burroughs, and the film projectors were the only employees left in the theater. Because of this manager on duty statement, the young man is released. After Harvey Oswald was arrested and taken out the front of the theater, Lee Oswald was escorted out the back of the theater. There's no police report, no record of arrest, no mention of a person taken out the rear of the theater. Captain Westbrook, saw Lee Oswald shoot Officer Tippett at 10th and Patton. Captain Westbrook produced a second wallet at 10th and Patton. Captain Westbrook either planted or knew exactly where to find the suspect's jacket. Captain Westbrook was the first officer to arrive at the Texas Theater. Captain Westbrook told his officer to cover Harvey Oswald's face and get him out of here. Captain Westbrook ordered police to compile a list of the names and addresses of the theater patrons, a list that soon disappeared. Captain Westbrook was the highest ranking officer at the Texas Theater. It was likely that Westbrook escorted Lee Oswald out the rear of the theater. During author Jim Douglas's 2007 interview with theater concessionaire Butch Burroughs, Burroughs said that he saw two different people arrested in the Texas Theater. He saw Harvey Oswald's arrest, and then, three or four minutes later, he watched his Dallas police arrested an Oswald lookalike. Burroughs added that the second man arrested looked almost like Oswald, like he was his brother or something. Apparently, Butch Burroughs saw both Harvey and Lee at the Texas Theater. Bernard Hare, owner of a hobby shop two doors east of the theater, saw the police escort a young man who he thought was Lee Oswald out the rear of the theater. Perhaps the young man in the balcony, who was identified by Deputy Sheriff Corson as Lee Oswald, was this man. For the next 25 years, Mr. Hare thought he had seen the arrest of Oswald. If Bernard Hare and Butch Burroughs observed Lee Oswald taken out the back of the theater, then who 
if not Captain Westbrook, was responsible for escorting him out of the back of the pier. After all, it was likely that Westbrook, who watched his co-conspirator, Lee Oswald, murder Tippett only half an hour early. After Oswald was taken out the rear of the theater, someone, perhaps Croy, then drove Oswald to a two-tone 1957 Blue Plymouth that was parked nearby. Croy told the Warren Commission that after leaving 10th and Patton, he drove by the Texas Theater. How convenient. Captain Westbrook returned to his office at police headquarters shortly after 2 o'clock p.m. A few minutes later, before Captain Fritz began to interrogate Oswald around 2.20, someone told him that Oswald lived on North Beckham. Now, who in the police department, other than Captain Westbrook and Tippett, who was dead, and Croy, who was allegedly with this estranged wife, who knew about Harvey and Lee? Who knew Harvey Oswald's address on North Beckley at 2 p.m.? And who had immediate access to Captain Fritz, Captain Westbrook? Around 2.15, Sergeant Hill, assigned to the personnel office, brought the 38 revolver taken from Harvey Oswald to Westbrook's office. This gun should have been taken immediately to Homicide and Robert, but Hill brought the gun to the personnel office. Why? This 38 revolver remained in Captain Westbrook's personnel office for the next hour. I believe that Captain Westbrook secretly switched the revolver taken from Harry Oswald at the theater with the revolver used to murder Tippett. I believe that that pistol was given to Westbrook by Lee Oswald shortly after the assassination. The 38 revolver used to murder Tippett was initialed by a police officer as in Westbrook's office, entered into evidence, and turned over to the FBI later that evening. The 38 revolver taken from Harvey Oswald and brought to Westbrook's office by Sergeant Hill disappeared and was never seen again, thanks to Captain Westbrook. I believe the revolvers were simply switched. So for approximately one hour, there were two 38 revolvers in Captain Westbrook's office at police headquarters. The one given to Westbrook by Lee Oswald, the one used to shoot Tippett, and the one taken from Harvey Oswald at the theater. This revolver was then turned over to FBI agent Vincent Drain at 11.05 and immediately taken to FBI headquarters in Washington, D.C. I'm going to finish this by a summation, a brief summation, on Captain Westbrook. Prior to being questioned by the Warren Commission, Captain Westbrook was asked to provide a resume relating to his involvement with the Tippett shooting. Warren Commission Attorney Joseph Wall asked Westbrook, when did this happen? You gave me a sort of resume of what you had done, but you omitted this incident. Westbrook not only omitted any mention of the suspect's jacket, but lied to the Warren Commission again and again. Westbrook falsely told the Warren Commission that he didn't have a car and was driven to the Tippett murder scene. He told the Warren Commission that he walked from the police station to the Texas Book Depository. Westbrook never once mentioned to anyone that he found a wallet at 10th and Patton or was given a wallet at 10th and Patton that contained ID for Lee Harvey Oswald and Alatine Hill. Once the jacket was found in the murder scene, Westbrook falsely claimed, quote, he turned his jacket over to one of the officers. Westbrook said he rode in a car driven by FBI agent Bob Barrett to the theater when, in fact, he drove his own car. Just before Oswald's arrest, Westbrook said he stood at the back door of the theater, although he really entered the front of the theater, according to news reporter Jim Ewell, who was with him. After Oswald was arrested, he was placed in Westbrook's own car. This is the car that Westbrook claimed he didn't drive to the theater. And in Westbrook's car, Oswald was driven to police headquarters. We have to wonder why Captain Westbrook, in charge of personnel at the Dallas Police Department, would involve himself in a homicide investigation. And we have to wonder how Captain Westbrook was able to be in so many places at just the right time, criminating evidence, if he was not a co-conspirator. The lies and factual omissions in Captain Westbrook's accounts of his personal involvement in the event surrounding the murder of Tippett have two common themes. Number one, they hide his involvement in the murder itself. Number two, they downplay his central role in blaming the crime on Lee Harvey Oswald and leading the police directly to Oswald. Following the assassination, Captain Westbrook relocated to South Vietnam, where he worked as an advisor to the Saigon Police Department. 
courtesy of the CIA. The, answer, the unanswered question is, who was Captain W.R. Westbrook? Wow, relocated to South Vietnam. And who's in charge of the Saigon military mission? Ed Lansdale. Oh! Lee Oswald, wearing the white t-shirt, was not in jail. And shortly after Oswald's, Harvey's arrest, he was seen driving a two-tone blue 1957 Plymouth back and forth on Davis Street, just six blocks north of the Texas Theater. Oswald soon drove his car behind a large billboard and appeared to be hiding from the police who were patrolling the streets. Mr. T.F. White, a career mechanic who worked across the street at Matt Pate's auto service, was curious and walked over towards the car. The man sitting in the car with the engine running was wearing a white T-shirt and looked directly at Mr. White. As White walked toward the car, the driver quickly sped away to run gravel with his rear tires. White wrote the make and the model of the car and the license plate number in his notebook. After seeing Oswald's photograph on television, Mr. White contacted the FBI. He told FBI agent Charles Brown, the man driving the car, was Lee Oswald, and gave him the number of the license plate. The authorities soon determined that the license plate were registered to a two-tone blue 1957 Plymouth that was owned by Tippett's best friend, Carl Mather, an employee of Collins Radio, a very important CIA contractor. So, Lee Oswald murdered Tippett, and an hour later was driving a car owned by Tippett's best friend, Carl Mather. Wes Wise, who was later the mayor of Dallas, accompanied by a CBS reporter, interviewed Carl Mather and his wife over dinner. Barbara Mather was calm, but Carl Mather was so upset and agitated he was unable to eat. Years later, Carl Mather agreed to be interviewed by the HSCA, but not before insisting on a grant of immunity. Ken Porter, another employee of Collins Radio, quit his job shortly after the assassination, divorced his wife, and married Oswald's widow, Marina. In the FBI report relating to Mr. White's sighting of Oswald driving Carl Mather's car, the FBI changed the two-tone blue 1957 Plymouth to a red Ford Falcon. This allowed Carl Mather's wife, Barbara, to tell the FBI that they'd never owned a red car. The fate of Harvey Oswald in Dallas police custody until he was killed by Jack Ruby is well known, but Lee Oswald's whereabouts following the assassination become increasingly difficult to follow. One intriguing account of his possible escape from the Dallas area comes from a decorated U.S. Air Force 20-year veteran named Robert Vinson. Vinson said that on the afternoon of November 22nd, he was a passenger on a nearly deserted C-54 cargo plane that departed from Andrews Air Force Base in Maryland. Soon after the assassination, the plane was diverted and landed on what appeared to be a road under construction near the Trinity River south of Dallas. There, Vinson said, a jeep carrying two men and a driver pulled up to the plane and two passengers came aboard. Vincent said the taller man might have been Cuban, and after he saw televised pictures of Lee Harvey Oswald, he felt sure the shorter man looked an awful lot like Oswald. The flight continued on to an Air Force base in Roswell, New Mexico, where all passengers deplaned. Vincent said he was told the entire base was on lockdown until, until later in the evening. Let me say something here about two Oswalds. There was a time in my research when... Obviously, I didn't know what was going on. I called them, just like you're calling them, one Oswald and an imposter. Various impersonations of Oswald. I knew about all that. And I knew there was something going on with Oswald's earlier life, starting with, in my research, of Paul McBride, who said Oswald was in Japan with him you know, in New Orleans at the same time, and a few other things here and there. And I didn't put a lot of emphasis on it, but I was curious. Why does McBride say he was with Oswald for eight months 
but also it's clearly in Japan. So, you know, I just couldn't put it together. But Jack Ruby is the one that kind of, in, at least in my mind, put things together. When I started reviewing the documents in June, July, and August, there were quite a few people who said they were with Oswald. Ruby was with Oswald. Oswald was driving Ruby's car back and forth to the mechanic and so on. And I thought, that's, wow, Ruby and Oswald, that's really interesting. And then just like a light bulb turning on in a dark room, and it was like, oh, my gosh. These people are talking about Ruby and Oswald, but this is Dallas, Texas, in July and August of 1963. Well, or Harvey Oswald are in New Orleans. That's what led me to think that it was Ruby and Lee Oswald that were together and probably participated in setting up Harvey as the assassin. So the reason I'm saying this is, if you go back and look at the two Oswalds, you, clearly we have two Oswalds being set up, you know, November, October, and so on. We go back to August, we go back to July, we go back to June, and if these witnesses are correct, you've got an Oswald with Ruby in Dallas when Harvey is in New Orleans. If you go back further, you've got multiple reports of Oswald at the Dallas Garland Airport in 1962. He was arrested Lake Pontchartrain, New Orleans, 1961. Then you've got Hoover's report saying something's going on there, using two Oswald's birth certificates and so on. Then you go back to the time when Oswald's in Russia, and I've got many reports, credible reports, and I wrote a long article about it, that involved the actor Steve Landisberg with Oswald in Greenwich Village in 1961 and 62, where Harvey's clearly in Russia. It continues. It's in other words, it doesn't stop just in 1963 when they're setting Oswald up for the assassination. The duplication goes on, you know, prior years, prior years. That's essentially all I've done. 